City Hall. This is the Boulder Planning Board meeting of October 18th, 2022. It's 6 p.m. and we have a quorum. So the meeting is hereby starting. Uh, and I'll call it to order. The, the first item on our agenda is uh, approval of the minutes for July 19th, 2022. Um, has everyone had a chance to review those and uh, provide any changes to, to them if necessary? If, if everyone agrees they're appropriate, I would entertain a motion to approve them. So moved. Do we have a second? Laura? Sure, I'll second. Good, thank you. All right, all in favor of uh, approving the July 19th minutes, raise your hands, please. One, two, three, four. Sarah, I guess you weren't there. Okay, all right, we have a unanimous approval for those who were there. So thank you, Amanda. All right, we'll move on to the next section of our meeting, which is uh, public participation. And this is the time when anyone who wishes to may address the planning board on any issue other than uh, what we're holding a, a public hearing on tonight. And uh, tonight we're having one item for a public hearing that's uh, regarding the changes to the land use code in the Boulder Revised Code uh, for updating the use table and use standards for industrial uses and districts. So if you want to address the board on that issue, please wait until the public hearing. But on any other issue, now's the time. So we'll be interested to hear your comments. Amanda, do we have any folks who want to address the board? John, I think we'll have Vivian actually read our rules of decorum real quick for the evening. Okay, very good. Yeah, I'll just jump into that quickly and then we can we can go over to the um, public participation. Um, great, thanks for bringing up the slides, Amanda. And um, thank you, Chair. Thanks everyone for your participation today. My name is Vivian Castro-Wooldridge. I'm the planning engagement strategist for the city of Boulder. Um, my role in planning board meetings is to facilitate the public engagement parts of these meetings. Um, and as always, the planning board will be starting with open comment from community members. Um, so we'll talk to you about what public participation will look like in this meeting. Um, so as I mentioned, we're going to start with open comment and then there'll be public participation uh, with public hearings according to the agenda. And we just want our participants to know that the city is really striving to lean into a vision co-created by the city staff and community for productive, meaningful, and inclusive civic conversations. The vision is really designed to promote free conversation um, while also recognizing that we want to make sure everyone who's participating feels both emotionally and physically safe and that we're allowing for lots of different viewpoints and identities and perspectives in our meetings because we think it, uh, it does lead to more informed decision making. Next slide. So we have a lot of information um, on the website about what we call our productive atmospheres vision. Um, and you can take a look at that if you're interested in more detail, but I'll be a bit specific right now uh, for this meeting. So there are a number of rules of decorum that are found in the Boulder Revised Code. And we have some general guidelines that are advisory in nature to share with all of our meeting participants this evening from the community, as well as planning board and staff. And we ask that all remarks and testimony raised tonight be related to city business. Uh, we'll, we will not allow any participant to make threats or use any other forms of intimidation against any person in this session. Obscenities, racial epithets, and other speech and behavior that disrupts the meeting or otherwise makes it impossible for us to continue in the moment is prohibited. Um, and we also ask please that participants identify themselves by the name they are commonly known by. Um, and I see most people have done that and we'll, we'll change it over for um, those folks joining by telephone. Um, and, and we ask that you display your whole name before speaking so we can call on you properly and so that we know who, who's providing input tonight. 
Um, so currently we're all in the Zoom web webinar format. This means that participants are allowed to speak their testimony, but we won't be turning on video for community members because of security concerns in this um, platform. I wanna point out that there was no pre-existing list for signing up to participate today. So um, if you're here today, thank you. And we welcome you at the appropriate time to raise your hand and let the chair know you'd like to give testimony. Um, and on your screen, you'll see a couple of different ways to do it. At the very bottom of the screen, you'll see a horizontal menu with three clickable items. And if you click on the hand icon, it'll raise a hand next to your name and we'll know to call on you. Um, you can also, if you have an expanded menu, go to the raise hand icon by clicking on reactions. Um, and there's a couple of people participating by phone. So we wanna make sure this is as inclusive as possible. Um, you need to dial star nine um, to, to, to get the hand to be raised next to your name. And then the chairman um, will let us know that you've raised your hand and would like to speak and, and we'll make it possible for you to speak. So um, just a couple more points. We're not doing any interpretations, so, the, so I won't go over how to access different languages. Um, and I think Amanda would be, is the CC already turned on? I think it'd be helpful if we could turn on the live transcripts. Um, and just to stress again that the public participation part of the meeting coming up is a chance for you to share topics outside of the agenda. Um, there's not a lot of time in this format for significant back and forth, but we're all listening and appreciative that you're sharing um, and a council member may, or a, sorry, planning board member may choose to take up your issue in a, in a meeting agenda down the road. Um, so other than that, I think we've covered the basics and we can go to the, to the comments. Let's see if there's any raised hands. Would anyone like to speak in this portion of the meeting? Just give it a minute. I don't actually see any raised hands. Okay. Uh, oh, sorry. Lynn, uh, you can go ahead. Can you show the timer, Amanda? Okay. So it's just Lynn. Um, and Lynn, you have three minutes. Just we there we go. Yeah. Um I don't like going to meetings where I can't tell who is at the meeting. And so I suggest that you get rid of Zoom webinar. It does not support that for all the boards and the council and they're all integrated. So, you know, you're disengaging your public. And why is it, I'm the only one in Boulder that speaks out. How, how, is, how does that happen? Isn't that a reflection on you? Isn't it? There should be piles of people. I hear people complaining all the time. You know, like this weekend, you know, you know what Open Studios is, the art thing I really look forward to each year. I wouldn't go to El Dorado Springs because it'll take me a half an hour to get through where the Hill Hotel is being positioned and the traffic is so bad between North and South Boulder on Broadway. So I can't enjoy it anymore. You know, you don't have any constraints of land use such that places like Art Hardware, Menninger's are protected, that the Gen Trail Service top hat is protected, that, you know, the things that make Boulder functional, even Hoshi Motors, you know, is getting tracked over with high-end condos. And the elephant in the living room is CU South, and there's nobody here to speak to it. If CU South passes for, you know, expansion, and yes means no, and that's what Everyone should vote. Yes means no. No more see you. No more too much of a good thing. You know, it just puts up the demand for affordable housing so much that you're in a cycle of despair, constantly scrambling to get more affordable housing. 
And then, like I say every single time, the more affordable housing you have, the more demand for affordable housing goes up because of the services for that affordable housing. So what are you going to do about it? All I hear is, you know, touching the edges of it, not getting to the fundamental problems that cause it. And that's wealth inequity. And that's giving subsidies to developers. And that's letting CU expand. Done. Thank you so much, Lynn. Um, I don't see any other hands for this portion of the public participation uh, part of the meeting. So I think with that, we can uh, continue with the meeting. Over to you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, the next item on our agenda is a question of call-ups and continuations and dispositions. And we have one call-up item to consider tonight. That's a use review, LUR 2022-00022. Uh, for a new restaurant and bar located inside a vintage shop, Garage Sale Vintage. Uh, so uh, you've uh, received the material here uh, that describes the, uh, the item. Does anyone have questions or want to call this matter up? Seeing, seeing no response, we will not call it up. And we'll move ahead to our public hearing item. John. Is, yes. I, I don't want to call it up. I just want to say I thought this proposal was very exciting. And I'm looking forward to Garage Sale Vintage uh, opening in that space at Pearl and 17th on the east end of the Pearl Street Mall. Uh, that's going to be a really wonderful addition to our community. So thank you to everybody who worked on that project or is working on that project. OK. All right. We'll move into our public hearing item tonight. And uh, I would, uh, Sarah, I would like to inform my, my fellow board members of uh, some uh, of how we intend to, to deal with this tonight in an effort to move it ahead as efficiently and quickly and painlessly as possible. Uh, Sarah and I had a another meeting with uh, Maro, the specialist who joined us at our retreat uh, a week ago in an effort to set up a procedure that would be efficient and, uh, and uh, make everyone happy tonight. And so I, I would like to explain it, how we propose to proceed and make sure that this makes sense and uh, seems reasonable to, to all of my fellow board members here. Uh, We'll start out with a presentation by uh, staff that will be fairly detailed and probably go a bit longer than our normal staff presentations. And the reason for that is that uh, this is a, a pretty complicated and detailed matter that we'll be dealing with. Um, following that, we will uh, have uh, uh, questions from the board to staff and we hope that all the this section following the staff presentation that the questions will be limited strictly to real questions rather than trying to uh, pers persuade or uh, de describe the individual's opinion on any issue. Uh, following that, we'll have the public uh, hearing. And thereafter, we'll have the board discussion. And during that discussion is the time when it's appropriate for board members to make their thoughts known about any, any of the issues that uh, this is dealing with and uh, their concerns and so on. And thereafter, we will uh, uh, address each change and each issue that has been raised separately and have a a uh, brief but uh, hopefully coherent discussion uh, on that specific issue and subsequently take a, a vote on, on where we stand on that. And the intention by doing that is, is to make this move ahead in a, 
in a more efficient manner than some of our previous meetings have, have done. Uh, and I, I hope you agree that that's a reasonable way to move ahead. Uh, Laura? Oh, is that a thumb? Okay, good. All right. Can I just Sarah? add one thing? So, what, so we are going to try to go through pages, I think it's 57 and 58. That that are that Lisa pulled together. That's a summary of the changes. That that's when we get to our dis our dialogue, we'll go we'll use that as our sort of framework to for. Um, we'll go through each one. People can either raise issues or we'll count noses. Maybe there'll be no concerns or questions at all, and then we can come back through when it, we can knock off the ones where there's no questions and focus on the ones where there are and begin to talk about, um, ha uh, have the discussion about the issues that have been put on the table and begin to discuss how we might wanna address or mitigate those issues and, and try to be really linear about the whole thing. And I'm taking notes, so you might hear me say, Mark, I think what you're, I think what I'm hearing you say is X so that then I can write a note so that it's on the list. So when we come back through it, uh, your concern has been noted and we can begin to discuss it. Thank you, Sarah. That was a very clear exposition of how we propose to move ahead here. Okay. So with that, oh, Mark. I just wanted to clarify um, page Pages 57 and 58 are the summary of changes. Is that what we'll be using as our guide? Okay. That's correct. I, I just checked between the two different packets I had downloaded, and they're and they're both the same, regardless of which version you might have. So good. Right. You thank you, Mark. <laughs> I checked that too. <laughs> okay. Very good. So I'll invite uh, staff to move ahead and uh, entertain us with your presentation here. Great, thanks so much. Uh, good evening, members of the board. Lisa Hood, a senior planner in our office is gonna be making staff's pres presentation this evening. So um, feel free to take it away, Lisa. All right, thanks, Charles. Good evening, members of the planning board. I am looking forward to talking to you today, again, about the use table and standards project. We have a proposed draft ordinance for you to review tonight. So I'm gonna be going through some background of the project, uh, go over a little bit of the public input that we've been hearing, and then walk you through the changes that are proposed in this ordinance. Just a reminder what the purpose of this meeting is tonight. It's for you as the planning board to make a recommendation to city council on this draft ordinance number 8556. You all have seen a lot of these background slides many times by now, but I'll go through it just briefly for the other attendees of this meeting. So the use table and standards project was started back in 2018. Phase one was adopted in 2019, and we are now in phase two, which is divided into three different modules of work. So we had module one was the user friendliness, focus on technical changes, uh, the functional fixes that was adopted back in June. We're now working on module two, which is related to industrial areas. And once that module is completed, we'll move on to talking about neighborhoods in module three. The goals of the use table and standards project are really to simplify and streamline this really important part of the land use code, make it more understandable and legible, predictable and certain, uh, definitely had gotten quite complex over time. Um, and also to really align this part of the land use code with the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan, goals, policies, and objectives, and really look to where there might be gaps between what the use, the use table allows and what the community has said that they desire in certain parts of the community. So that's kind of what the, the project is. This slide shows what the project is not. So this the project is really focused just on the use table and standards. So all of the regulations related to a land use, so types of businesses, housing types, things like that. It does not include a reassessment of comprehensive plan policies. 
like I said on the last slide, one of the main goals is to better align the code with the comprehensive plan. And so what we're really talking about is what are the best ways to implement those comprehensive plan policies, not kind of rehashing whether we agree with the comprehensive plan policies. Comprehensive plans are the result of many years of conversation with the community, uh, planning board, elected officials to come to those adopted policies. So the focus is really on what changes can we make to the use table and standards to align with that adopted policy. Also related to that, uh, with this project, the scope doesn't really include changes to form or intensity standards. So things like setbacks or floor area ratios, it really is zeroed in on things related to land uses and the regulation of land uses. Just a reminder that um, we've come before you with this project several times, so 2018, 2019, 2020, and then you guys have seen me many times this year talking about the different modules of work. And most recently in September, we had the matters item where we discussed uh, these industrial area changes. I did also want to remind us all of some of the feedback we've gotten from city council over the course of this project related to these industrial changes. Back in 2020, we got some general feedback from the city council uh, for supporting additional uses such as residential retail and restaurants in light industrial areas, as well as expressing a need to balance the protection of existing industrial uses and the introduction of new residential. When we went back in August of this year to city council to discuss this project, we got a little bit more targeted feedback on the potential changes and city council at that time um, supported updating standards for the standards for residential development in the industrial areas, specifically eliminating the contiguity requirement that exists currently and instead basing the assessment of suitability on subcommunity plan and comp plan guidance. They also noted that uh, it, it isn't appropriate to see residential in all industrial areas or sites, and so they would want to see guardrails to protect industrial uses, uh, particularly in the, in the IS, industrial service zones. And then related to offices, City Council expressed support for combining the professional and technical office use types, but also noted the importance of restrictions on office to um, or having restrictions on office to avoid displacing industrial uses and to avoid accelerating speculative office development. A uh, reminder also that this work continues to be guided by the uh, wealth of work that was done by the Planning Board Subcommittee back in 2018, 2019, and 2020. Um, this input continues to guide the project. They did a really deep dive line by line, column by column of the use table of changes that would better align the code with the comp plan. And so you'll see that the feedback that was given then uh, is really reflected in many of the proposed changes tonight. On a related note, um, I just wanted to go over kind of what we've heard from public input so far. Uh, we did some engagement work back in 2019 and 2020 on a more general level related to this topic. And for that work, we heard in an online questionnaire during the pandemic, um, a majority of respondents indicating that the city should consider allowing additional residential retail and restaurant uses in light industrial areas, really to foster these more as mixed use and walkable neighborhoods. And there was strongest support for additional restaurant uses followed by re retail and residential. We narrowed in as we continued work on this project and restarted after the pandemic and we had the virtual questionnaire on Be Heard Boulder that was open from late August through mid-September of this year. I did go over this with our matters item back in September, so I'm going to go through this pretty briefly. There were some, we did keep it open for about a, a few days after uh, we had met with you, so um, there's been a slight change in the numbers, but nothing, no big changes from what we talked about last time. So I'll just go quickly through that just to refresh our memories. Uh, we got 91 total responses to the questionnaire. Uh, it was a pretty simple questionnaire, asked people how important it was to them to retain space for industrial uses. We heard from the majority of people it was important or extremely important. We also asked specifically about housing and whether people uh, supported housing in industrial areas. This one was a little bit more mixed with about over a little over half of people saying they agreed or strongly agreed that housing should be allowed. Uh, 
15% in the middle, and then just about a third saying disagree or strongly disagree. Further um, asking, uh, just uh, elaborating a bit on that housing question, if housing was allowed in industrial areas, how should the city determine which sites are appropriate? Uh, we heard number one, close to supporting uses, then transit, case by case basis. Um, we have talked about this in the matters um, item last month, so I won't go too much into that, but this was an attachment to your memo. So if you wanted to see more detail, that is available there. And then you may remember this complex chart from September, but this is where we kind of threw out 25 different types of businesses and asked people what they thought was appropriate in industrial areas. So I just wanted to highlight kind of the highest ones that we heard were research and development, warehouse, manufacturing, cabinetry shop, um, artist workshops, biotech. Um, but then also over half of people said that they'd like to see grocery stores, retail stores, restaurants, coffee shops, some of the uses that are not currently allowed in the industrial areas. Moving forward with the rest of this public engagement, I mentioned this planning board subcommittee. It's been a bit re-envisioned for this next the upcoming um, modules of work. So we have both our planning board liaison group, which Sarah is a part of, and ML, who isn't able to be here tonight, who we've been meeting with about every other month to discuss more detailed, have more detailed conversations about these changes. And then we also have a use table and standards public working group. So that's a group of about 20 different people, um, residents, members of the arts and business communities who are interested in the work. And we've been meeting, we met with them in August to kind of talk about initial guidance for this, these changes. And then we met with them early this month to present the proposed changes and really talk through the details of that, those changes. Uh, we'll be moving forward with additional public engagement for uh, module three, and then also doing continued outreach as the adoption process of this ordinance moves forward. I wanted to highlight what the discussion was with the public working group and just kind of relay the comments that we heard in the, the working group meeting. So the changes to residential uses was definitely the main focus of the discussion during that meeting. Um, some of the members of the working group had concerns about the proposal to prohibit residential uses in the IS and IM zoning districts. And there were some also that had concerns about requiring a use review in IG, suggesting that um, if it's supported in the subcommunity plan, it should just be allowed by right. And then on the other side, there was a mixed bag of opinions. So there, on the other side, there were also several working group members who supported the, the proposal to prohibit residential uses in IS and IM or, and requiring use review in IG. Related to offices, some, of, some concerns that were brought up were related to the requirement um, prohibiting office uses on the ground floor. And then we talked for a while about the updated name for art and craft studio and the definition for that and how we could best kind of uh, signal what that use is really intended to encompass. Several of the working group members expressed support for allowing private schools in the industrial areas, as well as increased flexibility for live work units. There are also attached to uh, your memo tonight, there was additional um, information about the summary of those meetings as well, if you wanted to see those. All right, so getting into these changes, I just wanna start with a little bit of background on the industrial districts and the policy background that's guiding these changes. You all know that there are basically three areas of the city that have industrial zoning. And the real focus of module two is a comprehensive review of all of the uses that are allowed in our industrial zoning districts. And so we have the three areas. We have Gun Barrel, a small uh, portion of North Boulder has industrial zoning and then the East Boulder area. We have our four industrial districts. We have IS, which is the industrial service district, IG, industrial general, IM, industrial manufacturing, and IMS, industrial mixed service. Uh, since we met with you back in September, we've also been diving into the data about what the existing businesses are that are in our industrial districts. So we were able to pull from the North American Industry Classification System codes, the NAICS codes, uh, some more information about what 
types of businesses are there. So there's a lot of detailed information in one of the attachments to your memo, but just wanted to highlight what kind of the three most common types of businesses are in these industrial districts. So uh, professional, scientific, and technical services is number one, Oops. Um, followed by manufacturing and then wholesale trade. So for that first one, that's kind of some common examples would be computer systems design, architectural engineering work, research and development, manufacturing, most common, interestingly, electromatic or electromedical and control instruments manufacturing and beverage manufacturing. Yes, that does include breweries. Um, and then wholesale trade, which is uh, professional commercial equipment, durable goods, things like selling bikes and things like that. Ski equipment, climbing equipment, that kind of thing. So I thought that was really interesting data. There's more to dive into in that attachment as well, if you're interested. The policy background. So we've talked about this during the matters item. As I mentioned, the purpose of this uh, module and the use table project is to better align the use table with the comprehensive plan. And for this module, this is really focused on policy 2.21, which is related to industrial areas. And what we've been focusing on are really these three guiding principles that relate to land use. First, preserving established businesses and the opportunity for industrial businesses. Second, encourage housing infill in appropriate places. And third, offering a mix of uses. So in starting out these conversations and discussions and thinking about where there might be gaps between what we currently allow in our industrial districts and what the Boulder Valley Comp Plan is suggesting, um, these were some initial ideas related to those guiding principles. In terms of preserving established businesses, there's definitely some lack of clarity in the code on current on um, small scale manufacturing and arts and creative uses. There are opportunities to allow simpler review processes for some desired uses. And then um, currently residential uses are allowed in IS and then allowed in IM, which the, um, the purposes of those might be more um, for preserving those established businesses and industrial businesses. Secondly, encouraging housing infill in appropriate places. Residential development is currently guided by the residential development standards for industrial districts through a use review, which um, essentially establishes eligibility through contiguity to either residential uses or open space in parks, and there's a minimum lot size for those. And um, also going back again to residential uses being allowed in IS and IM. Related to offering a mix of uses, right now retail is prohibited in all industrial districts as a principal use. Restaurants are not permitted on major streets and also require a conditional use process. And personal services, so things like hair salons and bakeries are also prohibited in all industrial districts. Finally, mixed use buildings. So if you have any non-residential uses with a residential use, it has to go straight to site review. So requiring a higher level review. So those are some of the initial gaps. And in our conversations, taking in the public input that's been done at the beginning of this project or early in the project, and then most recently as well, we've now come forward with these proposed changes in ordinance 8556. So now I'm gonna go through uh, kind of one by one those main topics in that summary of changes. And like the chair said at the beginning, if we can, they are kind of disparate issues, but I think it's helpful to hear them all at once. So I'm gonna to try to get through all of them um, before we get to the clarifying questions. Um, so here we go. <laughs> um, and I did wanna remind you just of the key issues that we identified in the memo as we're going through these. So first, does the board believe or find that the, the proposed ordinance implements the comprehensive plan policies related to industrial areas? And do you, does the board recommend any modification? So those are kind of the things to keep in mind as we're going through these proposed changes. I'm gonna start with residential. So going back to those light industrial area guiding principles, so that green box on that slide before, what the comp plan says about residential is that housing should occur in a logical pattern in proximity to existing and planned amenities. It also highlights that residential should, or housing infill should occur within areas zoned industrial general or IG, and that it should be encouraged in appropriate places near other residential uses or retail services. The proposed changes in the ordinance before you tonight is to prohibit residential uses 
in the IS industrial service and IM industrial manufacturing districts. And then in the IG or industrial general district, continue re to require a use review for residential uses, but update those standards that are used to review it. So those updates include removing that contiguity requirement that I was mentioning, and instead using land use guidance from adopted subcommunity or area plans to identify the appropriate locations for residential use. The other changes are removing minimum lot size and some of the unique form standards that exist for residential uses. Um, but a lot of the standards are recommended to remain. So that includes keeping the requirement for an environmental assessment, the requirement for noise mitigation and exemption for residential floor area, and then also a requirement for owners and tenants to um, sign a declaration of use, which is a legal document that essentially says that they know that they're a residential use in an industrial zoning district. So these changes, staff finds, uh, the result would be that housing would be located in limited areas of IG zoned property where it's determined appropriate through adopted subcommunity or area plan policies with assurances still retained for potential environmental and noise impacts. I wanted to explain this a little bit further related to the subcommunity plans by just highlighting what those land use plans and maps would look like that we'd be using to determine the appropriateness. So starting with the most recent East Boulder subcommunity plan was adopted just a few weeks ago. So with the proposal, these areas, I added the kind of black dash line just to bring your attention to those, but those areas in hatched, um, hatched coloring, uh, those are the areas that are identified in the plan as appropriate for residential uses. So that's where, if it was zoned IG, a parcel would be eligible to develop with residential uses. And there's additional guidance in the plan related to the place types and things like that that would give further guidance. But really that foundational land use map is where we'd be looking for to determine that eligibility. Uh, similarly, we have the transit village area plan, which is just a portion of uh, kind of the, the eastern half of this plan is industrial zoning currently. And so you can look at that and see that the northern edge is identified as OI, office industrial, and that is identified in the plan as non-residential. So that'd be an area where residential would not be supported. Um, but there's other areas on that eastern side of the railroad tracks that are identified for high density residential or mixed use industrial where residential might be appropriate. Moving on to Gun Barrel, we have the Gun Barrel Community Center Plan, which also identifies areas where residential and industrial mixed use are appropriate, and then other areas that are uh, intended to remain purely industrial uses. I did want to note on this one that the gun barrel plan does not cover all of the industrial zoning in gun barrel, so that is one limitation. Um, there, the majority of zoning up in gun barrel is IM, so with the proposal for IM to have prohibited or for residential uses to be prohibited, that would um, not really impact it, but there are there is a little bit of IG zoning that is not covered by the subcommunity or, or area plan and therefore wouldn't have support for uh, residential development. Finally, North Boulder, I just wanted to show this one. There actually isn't any IG zoning in North Boulder, but just to show you what the land use map looks like there and that it does identify areas where residential is appropriate and where industrial is appropriate. All right, so that was residential. Now moving on to office. So the changes related to office are getting more at the goals of the project related to code simplification. We talked about this quite a bit in the matters item. Um, the idea to combine the professional office and technical office use types that are currently really difficult to administer and explain to business owners. Um, and just as offices have evolved over the last 30 years since that policy was put into place. Um, and But also making sure that we establish a new strategy to prevent proliferation of offices in industrial districts. That's something we heard through feedback from you all and also city council. So the idea is to combine professional office and technical office into a more general office use type. And then there would be a limit to the office size in IS and IMS of 5,000 square feet. In the IG and IM districts, the limits to office would be that offices could not be on the ground floor 
and there would be a maximum combined floor area of 50,000 square feet of offices. However, acknowledging that um, we do have many offices in the industrial district, technical offices mostly, um, we've also provided some additional language. It's actually very similar language to what we have in our business districts where we have a similar regulation uh, that provides some flexibility for existing offices and office spaces to be able to make minor changes, swap out tenants, change ownership, things like that without falling into a non-conforming change of use process. So the result here with these office changes, um, staff believes this will simplify part of the code that is difficult to administer while still limiting the amount of any type of office allowed in industrial districts and keeping flexibility for existing offices. We'll move on to the next one related to research and development. So the proposal in the ordinance before you tonight is to update the existing use type called medical laboratory to include more types of research and development and rename it as research and development. So updating the definition and then also renaming it. There are several uh, policies that support research and development in industrial areas in our comprehensive plan. It's also mentioned in the stated purpose of the industrial districts in the land use code. But currently it's not a use that's called out specifically in the use table. So research and development usually falls under manufacturing. It's explained in that definition. Um, sometimes it falls under technical office. So really just acknowledging that this is a common use and making sure that we um, give it a, a line in the use table so we can um, identify it like that. In the definition, we provide several examples of research and development types that it could be. So industrial, biotech, uh, life sciences, medical um, instruments or supplies. So that would be the medical lab, uh, as well as computer hardware or electronics. And the idea is that these uses need to be engaging in product or process design, design development, prototyping, or testing. And because it's really an extension of the existing medical laboratory use, it's proposed to be allowed in the same districts as medical labs are currently allowed, but the only changes are to limit the size of research and development uses in the IS and IMS districts, um, similarly to what the proposed limits are for office instead of requiring a use review. So we think the result for these research and development uses is that this common use in uh, the industrial districts, it's also one of the ones, it was number one in the questionnaire for what people think is appropriate in industrial districts, um, and one of the most common uses in those NAICS codes. This common use is comprehensively defined, and the language aligns better with the Boulder Valley Comp Plan and zoning district purposes, but there's a limited size in the IS district to preserve that, industri that service industrial space and uh, limited in IMS to pro promote a pedestrian scale. Moving into a little bit quicker for each of the remaining ones, um, retail uses and personal services. The proposal is to allow those at a limited scale, like, like I mentioned, these are both prohibited currently. So the draft ordinance sets a maximum of 2,000 square feet for these, site, these uses and also says that they must be in a building with industrial office or residential uses. So the idea with that is that these uses are really intended to be serving existing or um, future uses in the industrial areas. Related to restaurants, we heard a lot of public input support for additional restaurants in the industrial areas. So the proposal is to allow this use by right instead of requiring the conditional use process, and then to simplify the standards associated with this use. Uh, like I mentioned, they're currently not allowed on major streets, so eliminating those kind of standards. However, we'd still be keeping the hours of operation limitation. We're also similarly proposing that uh, restaurants must be in a building with other uses so that these aren't kind of like standalone building restaurants, they would also be serving the other uses in the area. Um, because restaurants were a highly supported use in the discussions we've had on this project, we've retained the option for use review otherwise, um, so that if a restaurant did want to be in a standalone building or extend their hours of operation, they would have that opportunity through use review. All right, moving on to live work units. So that's something we've also heard a lot of support through public input related to. And so the update 
the proposal is to update the definition of live work units to include commercial uses. Right now, it the definition limits live work to uses that would be permitted in the industrial areas. Um, and then to extend the areas where they're allowed. So allowing them in most mixed use districts, downtown business and high density residential districts, as well as industrial. Related to private schools, uh, which I mentioned earlier, the proposal in the draft ordinance is to allow private elementary, middle and high schools in the IG, IM and IMS districts with a use review. And similarly, to allow private colleges in the IMS district with use review. So this is really aligning many of our educational related uses so that they have similar review processes and restrictions. Indoor athletic facilities, this is something that currently requires a use review, no matter the size. And we've had several of these uses um, receive use review approvals. Um, so many of these are located in our industrial districts already. But in, a, um, in an effort to simplify the process for these business owners, um, the proposal is to allow small facilities, so those that are under 5,000 square feet, to uh, locate in industrial areas without a use review. Larger facilities would still be able to get a use review approval or apply for a use review to locate in industrial areas. Breweries, wineries, and distilleries are all grouped together as one use type. Um, and the proposal is to simplify and consolidate some of the minor differences in the allowances between different districts. So right now there's just some tiny differences between each one of the districts and it creates a really complex part of the code. So in an effort to simplify that, uh, we've consolidated the IS and IMS restrictions. And for the most part, this really is just an effort to, of simplification, but it does make one substantive change. And that is that in the IS district, currently a brewery, winery, or distillery, if it wanted to um, be larger than 15,000 square feet, they could ask for a use review, apply for a use review. With these changes, they would no longer be able to go for that use review. So it would be capped at 15,000 square feet. And then finally, this is the last one. These are kind of the um, not specific to a single use, but we've also made several updates to definitions or names of uses. So I mentioned that we talked for a while with the working group about how to best describe art or craft studio. And so the proposal is to update that to art studio or workshop because it really does um, involve some craftsmanship, trades, uh, small scale manufacturing. So trying to get at that and then some updates to the definition to um, be more permissive of the types of uses that these are the types of activities that these uses are engaging in. Broadcasting a recording facility, this is just a bit of an outdated term and definition. So that's been updated to a more general term of media production. And then related to manufacturing, right now we have manufacturing uses and manufacturing uses with potential offsite impacts. It's much more common in many cities to have kind of a tier of manufacturing uses. So light, medium, heavy, or something like that. Um, so we're proposing changes to those definitions and names so that there are light manufacturing and general manufacturing, which can better um, explain what the differences are between those. Finally, there's a few uses, or there's one use we're proposing to remove, that's the industrial service center. And that's um, only one property has been developed under that use type. And really the intent of that was to provide flexibility in the industrial areas for uses like retail and personal services. So with the other proposed changes, um, this kind of use type industrial service center would no longer be necessary. So we're proposing removing that and then also removing some of the unused definitions, so terms that are not used in the code anymore. And that is my summary of the proposed changes. Um, there are uh, some additional minor changes that I haven't highlighted here, but the your packet does have um, the detailed footnotes of every change. So if you have any questions, those should be able to answer those. And I'm happy to take any clarifying questions that you have at this point. Very good. Thanks for a very nice presentation. Um, so I'll open it up to board to ask clarifying questions of staff. Laura. Thank you so much for that presentation, Lisa. Could you go back to the slide about East Boulder and the East Boulder subcommunity plan and the land uses there for residential? 
Thank you. So um, my understanding is that those uh, hatched areas that have the black dash lines are not going to be IG zones anymore, that they're going to be either industrial mixed use or um, mixed use transit oriented development. So I, I, I'm not understanding how the changes to the uh, industrial general zone would impact those parcels. Yeah, that's a great opportunity to clarify. Thanks for bringing that up. So there are additional changes that will need to be made to uh, the East Boulder area. And so we're anticipating future rezoning, potentially form-based codes, other things that would ha um, have to be put into place to fully implement the plan. So this is really um, in the... To, in the meantime, while these parcels are still IG, these regulations would apply, or if any of these properties maybe didn't rezone to some other zone. So it would apply as long as um, any of these remained IG. Okay. So, and, uh -huh. Okay, thank you. That's helpful. And then I think that the light gray areas that are not in black, those are meant to remain IG zones. Is that is that right? Right. So yeah, I should have mentioned that. So the areas that are not uh, circled by my little dashed line. Those are not. Those are outside of the areas of change. So there's not um, anticipated rezoning or any changes to those areas. So they would okay. remain whatever district they are now. Okay, but I think that they are. I think they are IG. I could be wrong about that. Yeah. yeah so would these be. new these new regulations that permit housing would they permit housing in those light gray blocks even though those are outside of the areas of change to call for in the sub community plan? No, or they would. They would not. So because they aren't identified as um, areas of change, mixed use industrial or uh, mixed use TOD, where it says that residential would be appropriate, then it would not be supported to uh, request that use review in those areas. Okay. Thank you. That's very clarifying. Yeah, thanks. Sarah. Uh, thank you. Um, I have a bunch of questions, one of which Laura just asked. So just to clarify, both in the areas where there's no change in the East Boulder subcommunity plan, even though they remain IG, and IG will be allowed um, to have residential development uh, because they're part of an area plan, that change does not apply. Is that correct? Right. They would have to have support in on the land use map that says a change to residential in order to go for that use review for residential. Okay, excellent. Um, so I will follow up with the question that's related to that, but is not actually the key question I have, key clarifying question. And it has to do with um, what, what about, how do you deal with conflicting um, guidance, uh, particularly in the um, PVAP phase two? Um, I think there's some conflicting uh, guidance. From, from the use table revisions you're proposing and the uh, sort of land use, the generic land use converse, uh, where, where they are right now with the land use in the uh, TVAP2, how does this process, um, what is what has the priority? I mean, I guess I'm, uh, I'm a little confused. Um, I'll give you the example. This use table change says no residential in IS or IM, but TVAP phase two would rezone IS zones as mixed use industrial um, for a total of one and two for a total of 35 acres, which would allow residential uses. Like, so how does the city um, work through those conflicts? I think I'm fully understanding your question, but let me know if I go off base. Um, so in the meantime, so that guidance that you're referencing in the plan talks about future rezonings. This actually gets kind of similarly to Laura's question. Um, so it applies while these are IG. If there's additional rezonings that happen or it, it changes to a completely different zone, um, then this wouldn't apply because it's only uh, related to when, when properties are IG. So there might be something that is identified for um, residential that isn't IG. So I, for instance, with the transit village area plan, a lot of that Southern portion is IS. So we're proposing that uh, residential would only, even though the IMU2 land use designation says that uh, residential might be appropriate because it's not IG, 
it wouldn't have that uh, ability to go for residential with a use review. So, so the, uh, so it, it sounds, all right. So this, the use table changes would trump for lack of a better term, uh, what's been proposed I, it's, I, I think it's just a little confusing. It's confusing to me. Maybe it's not confusing to anyone else, but I, these moments of transition, it's a little confusing, uh, particularly in the IS, uh, because we want to save that industrial service area. When I looked at the uh, transit village map, I, I just didn't quite understand how we protect that IS zone given the um, tentative uh, area plan that is reflected here. So I'm, I'm just trying to understand, again, how the city prioritizes which changes it is uh, uh, putting first. And right. I guess I'm really... Yeah, no, I think, I think maybe the, the disconnect is the difference between like what a land use designation is and what a zoning district is. So a plan, TVAP was adopted 15 years ago and has had these land use designations in place, but the zoning is really what regulates that land. And so until something is changed to that zoning and those regulations, um, these are the, what's adopted in the plan is guidance for the future. And so um, not to say zoning trumps the land use, the, the, the land use is the policy guidance for the future. Um, the zoning is the actual regulatory power on that site at any, any specific point in time. Does that help? I think so. I'm going to, I'm going to trust that you guys want to maintain this IS zoning with no residential um, and, and we'll go forward from there. I think it helps maybe to, to look at it as a two-step process, you know, for a property owner or a developer. So if they own a property in this area, the st first step is, is it IG zoning? If not, then you can't go through the use review process for residential. If it is, then you go and you check the, the area plan or subcommittee plan. If it says that residential is anticipated for your area and you have IG zoning, then you can submit for the use review. So that could change, you know, as part of the phase two of TVAP, you know, there might be a change in zoning to implement this land use plan. And, you know, then a developer would, or a property owner you know, would have to look at it through that two-step process. Okay, so for the IS portion, I'm, I'm sorry, Mark, to keep adding, I just want to make sure I'm understanding. For the IS portion um, of TVAP2, it's the IS that is that has precedent or precedence um, rather than the IMU2, which allows residential. That's correct. Okay, thank you. That's That was my question. Thank you so much. Okay, Mark. Well, um, <clears throat> all of Laura's questions and Sarah's questions have helped me understand this, but I still have some seemingly basic questions. Uh, the first one is, what do we have a number, and it can be rough number, what amount of IG zoned area is not covered by an area plan or a subcommunity plan? I don't have the acreage or anything like that, but I can tell you it's the southern, the southeastern portion of Gun Barrel. So if you know where Avery is, it's that industrial park area. So that's, and then west of that is mostly IM. So it wouldn't be impacted or because we're proposing to prohibit residential uses. But the that IG area kind of around Avery is the one that would not fall into the gun barrel plan and is IG. So in the city, the only area that is IG that is not covered by an area plan or a subcommunity plan is that portion of gun barrel? Correct. Oh. Okay. Um, hmm. Well, that just takes care of all sorts of questions I had, thinking that there were some areas that, other than gun barrel, that would uh, fall into that category. I'm going to stop. Uh, I'm going to look at my questions again and under the light of, uh, of that answer. Thanks. Okay. Sarah, you have a hand up. 
thank you. So um, uh, I sort of primed the pump with Lisa letting her know that I was going to ask questions about um, the live work stuff. So um, can we clarify what the uh, city planning or comp plan purposes are for live work units? So I think live work really exemplifies that idea of the 15 minute neighborhood in the most pure form because you are living and working in the same area. So I think it gets at goals for reducing um, emissions and things like that. Any travel, there's no travel between live and work. Uh, there's several mentions of live work as an alternative housing type, and there's a lot of support for a diverse range of housing types throughout the city. So just adding another type of housing is supported in several parts of the, both the comprehensive plan and many of these subcommunity plans. And so that's the policy guidance behind making these more permissive. It's also something we've asked uh, in almost every round of public engagement for this project and received a lot of support for. It's something that the planning board subcommittee also guided us to do was to expand live work units as well as the city council and previous discussions with the planning board. So that's where the proposal to expand and allow these in more areas of the city came from as well as the policy guidance. Okay, and just to, I, I will bring up the concern later. My concern is not that you're expanding where live work can go. Um, so the new definition of live work includes commercial purposes as well as the industrial uses allowed in the industrial zone where the dwelling unit, the dwelling type could be built. What is, what is a commercial purpose? Like, is that me sitting at my desk writing memos to my boss or is that making, what is that? Yeah, so the way that we reorganized the use table in module one is that we have the land use categories. Um, so we have like residential and then we have, uh, maybe that's about an example. So commercial is one of the overarching categories. And then we have the subtype, the subcategories. Um, so it would be anything that falls under commercial. And the proposal is that the definition or the use standards say that uh, whatever the approval process is for that commercial use is what would apply for the live work use. So if, for instance, it was um, an art studio that needs a use review in whatever district it is, um, that's the work function, then it would need a use review as a live work unit as well. Okay. Um, so, um, is, are there any, so if you s wrote in the memo that, um, uh, home, some, I think the la language was home-based businesses or there was a home occupations, home occupation. What is the difference between a commercial use and a home occupation? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, home occupation has to be an accessory use. So it has to be subordinate to the main residential use. Live work can be simultaneously, you know, they're both principal uses. So home occupation, we also have standards related to home occupation and people um, have to comply by that and get a business license for that. So obviously it's gotten a little more complex with everyone working from home, but it's really more like you're running a business out of your um, your home for that home occupation, but it's accessory to the overarching residential use and live work is both a residential use and a work use. Okay, so then this gets to the question I will end up bringing up later as a concern, um, which has to do with how do you enforce um, a, the live work requirements um, if the purpose is to have these 15 minute neighborhoods to have housing diversity where people are living and working in the same space. What is the enforcement mechanism to make sure that those live work units are actually used that way? Yeah, that's a good question. So the way it's proposed, it would be an allowed use, but it has specific use standards. That's where things show up in the use table as a, a with brackets. Um, so those specific use standards um, have like that the owner has to also be working in the work or has to also be um, the proprietor of the work. I forget the exact language, but something like that. So there are specific use standards that if they're out of compliance, we could enforce that. Um, also in areas like the IS district where no, we're proposing that no other residential use would be allowed. If there's no work function, then now you're a prohibited residential use and that could be enforced. Um, but definitely it, that would be probably come up as a challenge with these uses. 
um, just the way that sometimes uh, requirements for like ground floor retail, if that retail is never leased out, what the enforcement mechanism would be for that. So is there, if we were to propose um, making it a conditional use, so not, not trying to limit the presence of those dwelling unit types, but to make sure that the city actually had an enforcement mechanism, would making it a conditional use uh, be a tool to do that? Yeah, so a conditional use requires an administrative review process. So um, the conditions might be similar to what the specific use standards are, but they've uh, they've gone through the conditional use process, probably have a um, a, a declaration of use or, or disposition related to that approval. So um, there could be a little bit more. Um, there'd probably be a slightly more teeth in that enforcement, I would say, as a conditional use. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Mark. Okay, um, I'm going to try it again. Uh, <laughs> if if I'm a, if I own a building and my and it's in an industrial general zone, and now I know because other than gun barrel, other than a sliver of gun barrel, my building is part of an either an area plan or a sub community. Can I go to that area plan or that subcommunity plan and look at that and say, that's my building there. I can add residential as a second floor to my 10,000 square foot industrial building. I could add residential to the second floor. I couldn't do it by right. Is that correct? If it's if it was allowed in the subcommunity plan, I still couldn't do it by right. Correct. It would still need to go through the use review process. Okay. Um, are there any areas that are zoned IG? So when I look at like the East Boulder subcommunity plan and the many colored map, there, there it's like there's an overlay on top of when I look at the the general zoning map, and I see the IG zones and the IM and the IS zones, and then I look at something like the East Boulder subcommunity plan. Uh, are there areas that are IG that it's a question that um, it's a question whether or not residential is allowed, or is that it's just allowed in IG? period with use review. Yeah, let me go back to the East Boulder because I think that's a good example. Um, the areas that are not in these hatched um, zones are don't have support for changing the land use. Um, so those are outside of the areas of change. So if there's IG zoning in like say that bottom left corner, if there's IG zoning, this land use map should clearly tell you that residential is not something that the plan is envisioning for this area. And so you could not get a use review or apply for a use review for residential. However, in those crosshatch areas, there is land use guidance that says residential uses um, either are appropriate as the principal use or as uh, supporting use. And so in those areas with the hatching, that's where uh, IG parcel would be able to go for a residential use through use review. Okay, so I have a building, it's in an IG zone covered by the East Boulder subcommunity plan, but because it is not an area of change, my IG zoning um, doesn't, it, I, I can't go to use review at all, it's prohibited. Okay. Correct, and it, it's I'm similar to the contiguity requirement that we have now, it says that par that parcels in IG and IM would be able to develop under residential uses. But if you don't have the contiguity, you can't develop residential uses. So um, in that way, it's a bit of a similar approach. But the proposal here is to try to tie it more with the subcommunity planning, where there's been you know many years of conversations about where residential might be appropriate. And so it's more of a logical pattern of where that housing should go rather than the contiguity, which ends up being a bit more of like scattershot of random able, like the random ability to meet those conditions of contiguity. Was there feedback from either the 
planning board, subcommittee, the working group, community input that um, that the way it's the way you've structured it now is uh, too too proscriptive um, for not allowing residential in IG even with use review if if and when and if an area is covered by an area plan or a site plan. The concerns we heard from the working group were that the prohibition in IS and IM, that proposal was, and this was only from a few members of the working group, we also heard the opposite, but a few of the people said that that was too restrictive to prohibit because currently there is the option to develop residential in IS and IM. We didn't hear, um, well, we did hear that from a few people that if it's covered in IG, in a subcommunity plan, in the, the right part of that subcommunity plan that says it's supported for residential, there were a few people that said, why should that still be a use review? Maybe it should just be by right. Okay. All right. Thank you. I think I'm, I think I'm done. Okay. Lisa, can I, or, or John, can I reply to Mark just about East Boulder subcommunity plan real quick? Oh, okay, if it's clarifying, but we'll have our discussion later on. But yeah, just, ahead. just clarifying, just, just Mark, you know, the East Boulder subcommunity plan, the way that it's laid out is going to result in about 5,000 new units of housing in these areas of change. Um, and it is a trade-off. It won't be a scattershot. It won't be all throughout the areas, but the trade-off was that some of these areas would be preserved for industrial and that they were not considered to be as appropriate for housing. And so I think that's, that's why I would, well, I'm not going to say what I support or don't support, but I think that's the logic behind saying the residential should only be in the areas of change as defined by the subcommunity plan, because that's where it's really supposed to be concentrated and it helps with those 15 minute neighborhoods and you still get the preservation of industrial, even though you're adding so much more housing. Okay, thank you, Laura. Uh, I have a real quick uh, follow up question for staff uh, regarding the live work arrangements. How does one uh, actually define the work? Uh, does it have, if if somebody has a, a live work unit and just and sets up a lathe and just as a hobby starts uh, turning out uh, bowls and so on, uh, is under under the proposed uh, rules is that a legitimate uh, work use of that space or does it have to be? Uh, a tax tax paying commercial operation that is required to be in that space. It would need to fall under the use table as either a commercial or industrial use. So if they are selling their product um, uh, that they're using their lathe for, that would be an art, what's currently art or craft studio proposed to be art or st art studio or workshop. Um, so those kind of woodworking shops would be would fall under that use. So that could be the work function, and that would be a commercial use in the use table. But if if he's not selling his bowls, let's say, it's just his hobby. He's he's doing it for fun. That would really. not be that wouldn't be a work uh, a work function. That's just an accessory hobby. <laughs> so so there has to be a trackable, taxable, commercial financial activity taking place in that space. Yeah, and typically that's covered by a business license. So we would have either that, that way we could track that use as well. That's typically how we identify a lot of uses as well through business licensing. So, so, the, so could one require a business license as a condition of owning and using that space? I think that could be something that could be added as a condition or a specific use standard. I don't know if Carl maybe has any input. I mean, we typically don't have language in the land use code requiring a business license. I think just if they meet the, the terms of, of needing to operate under a business license, they just have to get a business license. Um, there's a lot of uses in the code where they have to get a business license. So I think you know, they would have to know that what they're doing is something that rises to that level in order to operate legally. Uh, yeah, there's actually a separate section of the code outside of uh, Title IX that requires business licenses. So I think we'd be covered there. 
so so that would be a legitimate way of determining that appropriate use of that space would be if there is a business license associated with it uh, and taxes are being filed and so on do I, do I understand that yeah that's correct I, I don't know that again that there needs to be a specific reference to business license you know there's a responsibility of, of businesses to understand that code section of when they have to get a license Okay, well, thank you. I'm sure there'll be further discussion of that, but thank you. Sarah. Thanks. Uh, these are, I have two clarifying questions. Um, on, uh, I'm, I did not see the new packet until uh, too late to go through it. So on the previous packet, page 44 of 224, there's a paragraph about residential allowances that reads, the proposed draft removes the requirement for site review if a project is mixed use, as well as most of the unique bulk and density standards and modification standards, with the exception of a specific FAR exemption for residential uses, the project would still be subject to the typical bulk and density standards and site review thresholds for all projects in industrial districts. Um, I'm super confused by that sentence. Um, and when I went back and looked at um, the actual changes in the code, proposed changes in the code, you, it looked like you had X'd out open space requirements and setbacks and landscaping and all that kind of stuff. So can you just really clarify what is required, what, when site review is required for a building with residential units in it in the IG areas? Sure. So the changes to the bulk and density, there's right now in the residential and industrial standards, there's unique setbacks and landscaping requirements, open space requirements. Um, they're very minorly different from what the standard uh, requirements are for any kind of development in industrial. So to simplify in an effort to simplify, um, that's where we're getting rid of those unique standards and having just the commonly applicable bulk FAR standards, things like that apply to non-residential uses. There is an exemption for residential uses that goes back to the jobs housing balance policy discussion where the FAR is quite limited in the industrial districts in an effort to keep those jobs down, but that doesn't apply to residential where we want to see more housing. So the FAR exemption remains. Um, the requirement for site review is, and that was kind of the gap or the issue between offering a mix of uses. We saw that as a potential issue because if you're developing residential and are under two acres in size or 100,000 square feet, um, you would not have to go through site review otherwise. But if you added any non-residential use under the current code, you'd be kicked into site review, which is a much larger process. And so that's really a um, inhibitor to a mix of uses, offering a mix of uses like the policy say. So the idea is to get rid of that um, site review requirement once you mix the uses and instead rely on the general threshold for industrial districts, which is two acres or 100,000 square feet of floor area. Okay, so, um, okay, so that's very helpful. Um, but I, but the, the, do industrial, does industrial uh, site review require things like setbacks, landscaping, and open space? Because that is an issue. Those are elements of residential life that and development that seem pretty important in in town. So, where do those where where do those apply or not. Yeah, so there's still the all of the setbacks that would typically apply in an industrial district um, uh, and bulk standards and things like that. So those would still apply the same to a residential project as they would to an industrial project in the industrial zone. So still our underlying um, intensity standards, which is chapter eight of the land use code, our um, form and bulk standards, which is chapter seven, that still applies to all of these. So it's not exempting residential um, development from any of those typical standards. Um, it's just aligning them so that they're not different than other development in industrial areas. But what about open space and landscaping? Yes, and there's still open space and landscaping requirements in okay. industrial as well. Sorry about that. Okay, and then I have one last question, which again, is just a clarifying question. 
how did you come up with the um, 50,000 square foot? Uh, I'm I was looking at my notes, so I'm reading what I wrote down correctly. So an office, uh, office um, component of the proposal, it's line, it's page, it's, this is actually in the, propo in the um, proposed ordinance, page 78, line 16, the combined floor area of offices that are principal use on the lot or parcel does not exclude 50,000 square feet. And I'm assuming that refers to the building, the space, not, not the parcel itself, but the 50,000 square feet is the maximum amount of office space that would be allowed in IG and IM in any given building. Is that accurate? Yes, that's correct. So the maximum okay. combined floor area of all of those uses. Okay, and how did you identify that number? Yeah, so we looked at several kind of example properties around industrial districts and example businesses just to see what kind of a typical size of each business is and what um, what the combined floor area of those might be. And so 50,000 seemed like a limit that would be able to capture the existing office spaces that we have because technical offices are currently allowed. So the concern was that um, even though the, the intent is to limit offices, there's still a concern to um, not create a ton of nonconformities by making these changes. So the 50,000 was an attempt to capture what's existing there and be able to provide that flexibility for those existing businesses, but to set a limit for future development so that beyond 50,000, um, we would have those limits in place. And it's a very similar standard to what we have in our business zones right now. The limit there is 20,000 square feet, but those are typically smaller parcels. The industrial parcels are quite a bit bigger. And the thing to point out here is that in the commercial zones, the 20,000 uh, can be exceeded if they have permanently affordable housing on them or if they get a use review approval. But in the effort of really trying to, you know, put the right guardrails in for office in the industrial zones, um, the ordinance does not include a use review uh, option for exceeding that 50,000 square feet. Okay. All right. I really appreciate all those clarifications. Thank you very much. Okay. I don't see any other hands up. I, I have a uh, following up on uh, something that Sarah was inquiring about. Can you summarize uh, to say that any residential space that is developed in IG area, that it would have the same uh, requirements as residential space developed anywhere else in the city with respect to, uh, say, the amenities of living there in terms of open space, in terms of uh, uh, parking, in terms of other aspects of residential life. I saw Carl unmute, so I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say he probably wants to answer that one. Yeah, I mean, the, the chapter 9-9 of the land use code is our development standards. So that's where all the requirements for open space, landscaping, parking, all apply. And it all applies uniformly to all projects throughout the city. So these residential projects would have the same standards. Um, they would still have to have the same type of features that qualify as open space as any other development in the city. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions of staff at this point? All right. Then we'll move into our public hearing. And uh, I'm not sure uh, who, uh, Who's going to organize that, Amanda or hi, Vivian? Hi, John. Yeah, I'm here. I can I can facilitate it. Okay. Um, good. Thank so you. this is the public hearing part of the meeting. Um, if you would like to speak, please go ahead and raise your hand. Um, so if uh, we have several people on the call who have not displayed their full name, if you can go ahead and, and change your name or um, or actually send it to us in the Q&A box and we can change it for you. I'll go down the list and call on each participant who wishes to speak. And each person will have three minutes to provide input or, or raise questions. So let's take a look here. Uh, 
Um, okay, so we have Kelsey Hunter. Um, thank you for raising your hand and we I will allow you to talk and the timer will start. Are you ready with the timer, Amanda? Great. Please go ahead, Kelsey. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Um, good evening, everyone. Good evening, planning board members. Uh, my name is Kelsey Hunter. I'm director of development for Biomed Realty here in Boulder. Um, we're new to Boulder and we're very excited to add value to this community through our assets um, that we currently have at Flatiron Park. Um, and we definitely appreciate the opportunity to speak out tonight. Um, Biomed Realty is working hard to meet the growing demand of the life sciences industry. We're um, we're a provider um, of real estate solutions that allow our life science tenants to perform, perform innovative research. And on behalf of the research and development community and our customers, we'd like to thank you for advancing the discussion on these use types. We'd like to thank you for providing clarity and certainty around the use definitions that will allow us, as well as our customers in this life sciences industry, to plan for advancing innovation, treatments, and cures of the future. We truly believe that R&D uses will positively impact growth in Boulder, and we're excited for the future here. In addition, we also understand that parts of the draft ordinance are proposed to implement the comprehensive plan and the ordinance will allow new amenities that will benefit Flatiron Park tenants and employees, including restaurants, gym facilities, retail, and other amenities that were shown during the presentation. We support the changes to allow more amenities and believe they will result in fewer industrial area employees getting in their cars driving across Boulder for happy hour, errands, lunch, et cetera. Um, in fact, because of these proposed code changes, um, we at Biomed Realty are looking at opportunities to add these amenities into our programming at Flatiron Park. We're looking to use those amenities to benefit employees as well as all the neighboring community members. Um, as we continue to, to, to digest the ordinance recently published last week and form an understanding on the impacts, we do appreciate the ongoing dialogue and engagement. We're looking forward to additional discussions and clarifications, but for now, just wanted to say thank you for your time and allowing us to voice our feedback. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Kelsey. Um, not seeing any other hands. Any other people here with us tonight who would wish to to share their input during the public hearing. Let's just give it a few moments to make sure. Okay, All looks right. like that's it. Thank you. That, uh, Hi, I'm rings. sorry, sorry. A couple, couple more. more hands. Yep. Hi, sorry. Brenda Rittenauer with our engagement team, just playing back up on the Zoom facilitation tonight. Um, also, just a reminder if you're on the phone, you'd need to press star nine to raise your hand. Thanks. Sorry. Thanks. No, thanks a lot. Thanks for that reminder. Um, and yeah, just a couple more popped up. So um, next up, we have Justin Hartman. So you have three minutes. Uh, please go ahead, Justin. Hi, thanks for, uh, thanks for having this discussion. And um, obviously I, uh, well, not obviously, I'm with Ozo Coffee, uh, just in case you know that or don't know that. And so we're gonna be impacted by the East Boulder uh, ordinance changes. And um, a couple things uh, come up with, around the idea of the residential, um, shared space with industrial and um, as someone who's a, a rentee or someone who leases property here in Boulder, um, as, as you might know, we're subject to property taxes for those buildings uh, within, our, within our triple net. Uh, it's, it's combined with our lease, basically. We're paying property taxes for the business owners in those spaces. And my, I guess one of my concerns is Obviously, property value is going to increase drastically with residential being combined with industrial spaces um, and slightly concerned with how that's going to impact rent in the industrial areas and slash uh, property taxes. Um, although I do, I do uh, 
uh, I am in favor of increasing affordable housing. Um, and just so that it's known, uh, you know, seven years ago, I would say I had very, very few one or 2% of my staff members commuting from out of Boulder. Uh, now I have people commuting from Arvada, Westminster, Thornton, Longmont, um, people are, and they're driving. So um, that's something that we, we, like I say, we didn't have that several years ago. So having affordable housing is important, um, not just um, penthouses in uh, industrial zones. Um, so that's, thanks for my, that, that's all I have for my time, but um, just wanted to express that. Thank thanks you. Thanks a lot, Justin. Um, so next up we have Lynn Siegel. Please go ahead, Lynn. I'd like to see some of the things that I use. Thrift stores. I don't, yeah, I make my own coffee. My own food is much better than anybody's food that I go out to a restaurant for. Um, and it's much, you know, I can't afford that. I live in Boulder. I pay property tax here. Of course, I can't do anything but pay my property tax, you know? So I'd like to have a little bit left for me, like a thrift store that I don't have to go five miles for. You know, Ari's, we're losing that. You know, uh, uh, Top Hat Janitorial. I like soap. I like things clean. You know, simple things that I can't get here in this town. Top Hat's now in Gun Barrel. I'm supposed to ride my bike to Gun Barrel. What gives with all of this? I can't go even look at an art hardware, you know, or at an art co-op because there's housing everywhere. And the housing, like that last guy was saying, is not affordable. It's not gonna be affordable. It might be affordable for a little while in some restricted areas. And the people that live in this affordable housing, how would you like to look out your window at somebody else's apartment? Not have any open space to go you know, out and play. No, you're gonna get in your car and go to the mountains. That's what Boulder's about now. Is that what we want for this town? You know, and I heard the East Boulder subcommunity people talking about how they didn't want to live, be part of an industrial center. They didn't want to be around an airport that's um, noisy and with toxic fumes. And I think you should have use review for the health sciences for biological waste. You know, there, there are things that affect humans when you integrate them into an industrial or or more mechanical zoning pattern but i i really what i want to see and it's not relevant to this discussion right because it's just how you rearrange the deck chairs on the titanic what i want nobody's even talking about i just want a lousy thrift store i want an art hardware a meningers you know when mcgeckins closes then what, you know, like, that's all we got left. Not much. Done. Thank you, Lynn. Anybody else from the public with us tonight who would, would like to take the time to share their input? I don't see any hands, but let's just give it a moment. Okay. L last call. Okay, John, looks like the public hearing portion is over. 
That Over brings our public uh, hearing section of this evening to an end. Uh, let's see. I think we'll take uh, 10 minutes before we begin our uh, discussion of the board on the board. So uh, see you at uh, 744.
Okay, Sarah, you got your uh, your chart in front of you. I can't hear you. I do, and I'm very excited about taking notes. <laughs> oh, and Lisa, I'm glad uh, I'm glad you joined us. <laughs> She's eating lunch, dinner. Yeah. <coughs> yep. Sorry, I don't have a good light on and i'm eating <laughs> but i am here this is always okay. a fun one i'm glad i made it it's a certain kind of fun lisa <laughs> okay it looks like most of us are here again Okay, let's see. Uh, if Vivian or Amanda is back, I guess we can start moving again. Okay, Amanda, can we start moving again? Yep, you can. Yep, go okay. for it. <laughs> Very good. Okay, um, so now what I think uh, the what we are doing is discussing among ourselves fairly specifically our thoughts and uh, concerns about what's being proposed tonight. And I think the best way- It's to like we might be uh, missing Laura still, John. Oh. Yeah, okay, let's give her a chance. You know, John, the one thing we did not um, make space for was answering that first question about the BBC um, policies and whether we felt it um, implemented adopted policies. Right. In, in fact, I was going to raise that. Uh, okay, great. So. Here she is. Oh, okay. All right. So let's move ahead. This, we have been asked by staff two, two major questions. One is the degree to, what, to which this, these proposals uh, are appropriate and based on Boulder Valley Comp Plan. And secondly, what changes we think are appropriate. Uh, so I think we'll organize this uh, discussion right now uh, on the on the based on the summary which which staff has provided. Oh, all right, very good. Wow, who's uh, who did this? Okay, Lisa is sharing her screen. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, sorry, I was going to explain. I did. I made this slide if it was helpful to because it aligns with how that summary of changes handout is Very laid out. Very so. good. Okay. What I was just going to say was that we'll organize our discussion on on the summary of changes that Lisa has prepared, and the topics you can see there. And so, what I think we'll do is uh, ask first of all everybody's opinion on whether this is all uh, uh, in, in line with the Boulder Valley Comp Plan. But then secondly, we'll go through each of these issues to see if anybody, uh, and we'll ask at each one of them, if anyone has a concern or a comment on what has been proposed in that, on that issue. And uh, we'll limit our discussion to the that issue, whatever issue it is we're talking about at that time. 
and we'll go through the complete list of issues so you have a chance to to weigh in on everything but hopefully that'll be a uh, an efficient way to to move ahead on this so uh i think we can start out by by learning if if everyone thinks this is in line with the comp plan does this implement the adopted policies of boulder valley comp plan related to industrial areas and sarah your hand is up um so i would um say it does and i would like to um propose um adding um 7.06 and 7.09 to the list that are um at least in the packet that gets sent to city council 7.06 is mixture of housing types and 7.09 is housing for a full range of households. And I'm proposing adding these two because <coughs> I have a bit of a concern that the focused on mixed use in IG will only produce one housing type. And um, I, we really wanna encourage a diversity of housing types. Um, so, um, that's one set of proposals I'd like to put on the table. And then also, um, we got an email from Bill Shutkin, who um, was talking about density. And um, I thought it raised a question for me that we've talked about before, or talked about in previous um, iterations of planning board, about the need for the city to update its in-commuter and missing middle housing surveys, so we actually know what no matter how dense we build, what it is we're building to, to meet the needs of this, um, the diversity of our community and in commuters and missing middle. So was also gonna suggest or offer up some sort of um, motion, separate motion or friendly calling, urging city council to um, uh, ask the city to update the missing middle and um, in commuter housing choice surveys. Okay. Any any responses to Sarah or other thoughts on on this question of whether the comp plan is being satisfied by what's being proposed? Mark. So I, I just opened up the BBCP and and I looked at seven point oh six and seven point oh nine. And um, obviously supportive of those, but how to, when you say add them to, I, I don't understand um, in the terms of our recommendation or not to city council to adopt an actual ordinance. I, I don't understand what you're proposing in terms of how to add them to what what is it that you want to add them to i'm just proposing adding them to the packet so that when so that the product that goes to city council and is the public record reflects these two additional housing goals of the boulder valley comp plan that that's my suggestion and i see carl just came on maybe he wants to say something I can just sarah i was just gonna jump in and uh bring up if the, um, the site review update that uh, we're currently working on and we'll be returning to planning board, just a, a reminder that we did add a site review criterion that related to housing types, like minimum types of housing. So obviously just having that in the equation for if a project comes in, it qualifies for site review. And if it's over a certain size, there would be, if those site review criteria are adopted would have a housing types um minimum requirement for projects so just factoring that into the discussion as well i appreciate that can i just ask one follow-up before we go to laura um my recollection of that part of that conversation was that uh there were some site I, i'm not going to get the language right but there were some at least one site review type where it only had to be one housing type um, and we, that was a discussion. So I don't know whether 
in the site review criteria update that you all are working on if you are requiring at least two housing types in every project or like how how is how does that housing diversity get reflected in the site review uh, criteria that you've updated? Uh, the proposal uh, right now is that anything under five acres would be one housing type. Um, one of the questions or one of the comments that came up in our last discussion with the board was that if such a project were all ELUs, then there would have to be two housing types. So we are proposing that uh, in the current state of the site review criteria. Okay, I, I appreciate that clarification. Thank you. And Sarah, just to answer your, or to clarify for both you and Mark, the, I did add, because you mentioned those policies in our matters item. So I added those to the project charter list of policies, but there's also the part of the memo that talks about specific policies. Uh, is that where you'd wanna see it? Or is it, it if it's in the charter, is that sufficient? Uh, um. Um, I apologize. I was trying to go back to my notes from the earlier in today's tonight's conversation under because what I'm trying to look, find the um, the minimum uh, the site review minimum is going to be two acres. Is that correct? Yeah, I actually misspoke. It's five acres or a hundred thousand square feet. I double checked that during our break. Okay, so it's five acres or a hundred thousand square feet, and the site review criteria update that you all are proposing would be that anything over five acres would require uh, more, is that right, more than one housing type? Yeah, anything between five and 10 acres would be two housing types in the proposal. Yeah, okay. Um, I appreciate that. I will say that, um, that's still five acres is a pretty big plot of land. Um, I, I so the question, the answer to your question, Lisa, would I be comfortable putting it? I don't know what not when you say charter, I think of the city charter, and that's not what you're referring to. You're referring to the um, list uh, of the various um, <clears throat> top plan goals that that this advances. That's where I would imagine putting these two additional components. Okay, I didn't, Lisa, I didn't hear what you said. It looked like you were saying yes, but okay. Oh, I was just clarifying in the memo, uh, it's where she, I, it's where I'm understanding it. Laura. Are you too many buttons? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, sorry, I have too many, too many things going on. So I'm trying to find these policies that Sarah is talking about in the comprehensive plan and Boulder Valley comprehensive plan. And I'm looking at the mid year, the 2020 midterm update, and 7.06 and 7.09 are different policies. They're not mixture of housing types and full range of households. It's strengthening regional housing cooperation and uh, preservation and development of manufactured housing. Is that something different? Am I looking at the wrong thing? Uh, no, I, I'm still using the hardcover of the Boulder Valley comp plan. So I'm referring to what's in the hardcover, but it would be mixture of housing types and housing for full range of household, whatever those numbers are now. I'm so sorry. Okay, sorry, sorry. Um, 7.07 and 7.10 looks like. So it looks like it, they went up by one number. <laughs> well, it, it says in the, but it says in our memo that's 7.06 and 7.10. Well, looking at the midterm update, it looks like it's 7.07 mixture of housing types and 7.10 is housing for a full range of households. So I think we should get the numbers right if we're going by the 2020 mid-year update. Mm -hmm. Not to be pedantic, but I think it, it, it no, might it's matter. Important. It's important. For yeah. Sure. And, you know, I, I appreciate what you're going for, Sarah, but I just don't understand. I guess I don't understand how it connects to this ordinance about where housing is appropriate in the IG zone. There, there isn't anything currently about what kind of housing, except that's in the sub-community plans that are already adopted. And 
I don't think that we're intending to change what's in those subcommunity plans, especially East Boulder that we just adopted. So it, it, I guess I'm looking to the planning staff. Is it appropriate to try to insist upon a greater range of housing types than already exists in the existing area plans and subcommunity plans? Like what would we be changing by referring to those things in this ordinance? The clarification is that it wouldn't impact anything in the ordinance. It would just be something that's in the memo that goes forward to city council as relevant comprehensive plan policies related to this change. Okay, I guess I can say I could see that we are helping to implement having housing for a full range of households and having a mixture of housing types in the city writ large by adding housing in general. I, I could see that. I guess I just don't, uh, Sarah, I feel like you're intending something beyond just a acknowledging that having more housing is good <laughs> for these reasons. Well, I mean, what I'm intending is to make sure that our priority is, is this diversity of housing, not just housing, because, um, and which is why I think Carl was letting, reminding us that there is this housing diversity component to the site review criteria, the, up, the soon to be revised site review criteria except of course there's this five acre, it's not about changing what's in the ordinance. It's about the context within which the ordinance is understood. And to me, housing diversity and housing for a full range of households is vitally important um, to serve in commuters, the missing middle, the college kids who live here, you know, folks who are moving here. And um, that, so to me, that's a priority those are two priority comp plan goals that I think are, I personally think are important to frame in the context for a project, which is about adding residential uses to our industrial zones. I think it's fine to name those. I'm not sure it will actually change how this is implemented in any way, but I mean, Lisa, if we added those things to the memo and the context, would that change how this how housing, what kind of housing gets added to these industrial areas? Uh, it depends. The memo, I mean, depending on what your recommendation is tonight, the memo could change very drastically <laughs> from whatever the decision is. So, or the memo could be quite similar to what you've seen tonight. So uh, it would just impact kind of the analysis that's done in the memo and maybe would touch more on those, those policies. I see Mark has some thoughts on this. Well, <clears throat> I'm concurring with Laura in, I think I am in essence with the question of if we are not changing the ordinance, what, uh, and without additional, without any change to the ordinance, um, then I don't see necessarily what the point is because the question is, does the ordinance implement the adopted policies of the BBCP. If in fact, uh, Sarah, you have a, you find a shortcoming in the ordinance based on 707 and 710, then I, I, then let's edit the ordinance. But if in fact, we don't really uh, have the stomach wherewithal, we think the ordinance is just fine, then uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure what we're doing. Well, I, I, if I can contribute a little bit to this, it, I have to say that the, the, this is important to be considered in context. And for me, these, uh, two, uh, uh, goals of the Boulder Valley comp plan are are absolutely relevant here and so i see no harm in adding them and i think that there is a benefit by reminding uh everybody what we're actually seeking may i re <clears throat> request i don't know how easy or hard this will be maybe you could send it sarah <clears throat> but could we get the language of the of those two uh, sections that you're talking about i know you read them into the record but i'd love to visually see them maybe you could send them to 
Yeah, let so me. Um, they're going to come. They're going to come from the hardback of the. Uh, of the uh, <laughs> okay, sorry, sorry for asking you to type. I, I just like to get my eyes on them because we've been talking about them for a while. Early warning. Hold on. So you don't <laughs> Thanks, want sure. I'm I'm happy to cut and paste into an email and send it immediately. Is that okay? Um, I'm I'm not sure that uh, using emails to each other is. No, not to each yeah. other, to staff, oh, and then I want staff to put it up on the screen. I think it's, oh, right. I think it's on page 86 or uh, 146. No, no. I'll just, I, I will, I'll take care of it. You guys keep talking amongst yourselves. No, in the, in the packet. They're not, it's not in the packet. It's not in the packet. I can, I'll just pull up the call plan and share my screen so we can look at that page together. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, I should get a hard copy of this sucker, a hard copy of the updated. So I think that's useful to look at the sections that Sarah is pulling out. But the question from staff is, does this ordinance implement the sections of the, the guidance of the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan related to industrial areas? So what are the specific guidance related to industrial areas that we're trying to implement? Because I don't think we're trying to implement everything in the comp plan through this ordinance. No, but this is about housing and industrial areas. Sure, but what's the guidance for housing and industrial areas? It, well, I, I don't if, think if it specifically we, says housing and industrial areas must include a mix of usage types, including townhouses and duplexes, right? It doesn't say that. It does. It does not. It does not, in fact, say that. That is correct. But these are we're talking about adding housing and industrial areas. And to, in my mind, uh, it is valuable to have the diversity of housing being a uh, Boulder Valley Comp Plan goal that is um, part of the discussion around when we get to that type of housing, what it will be, you know, that there will be a mixture of housing. I mean, that's L Lisa herself explained that the whole point of live work, the reason it's expanding where it can be is because it is a additional form of housing. It helps to build 15 minute neighborhoods, et cetera, et cetera. So to, in my mind, adding in 707 and 710, the, cor the correct numbers, thank you, Laura, is just a expansion on that idea of a mix of housing so that you can could, build- Could you click over to 710? Thank you. So pretty. The same yeah, slide. Pretty pictures. Um, okay. Um, uh, let me let me. I'll I'll just weigh in because um, I, I I won't call for thumbs yet, <laughs> but I think we might be leaning toward there. So first, let me say that I think um, uh, wh where I'm at as a planning board member is Sarah. I've heard your point. I thank you. I've I've heard from Laura. I've heard from Mark. I'd, li I'd like to start hearing from other folks on kind of how they're feeling about it. Um, where I'm at is reading through these. Um, you know, for me, this sort of gets at that mi missing middle issue that we're constantly trying to bring forward. Um, I don't see it as undermining what's there. I think it maybe adds some further clarification and guidance around um, what we're hoping to see happen in there. Um, I take the point that perhaps it's not binding or doesn't apply as much as we wish it might. Um, but I actually like that we're calling it out because this is exactly who can't work, you know, can no longer get housing at Ozo, who is moving out of Boulder so that, you know, we're talking about closing elementary schools, you know. Um, yeah, I, I don't really see the harm in including it, um, but if somebody sees harm beyond the fact that perhaps it's a bit inelegant or that you feel like it's not entirely relevant, I'd, I'd be interested in hearing that. Um, but I think where I'm falling is more on the side of including than not including. Um, and I'm looking forward to hearing from, and I don't want to shut down conversation for anyone who's gotten to talk so far, um, but I would love to hear from folks we haven't heard from um, and then maybe circle back. Okay, George. Uh, I, I, to keep it brief, I, I would second everything that Lisa just said. Okay. All right. I think it's time to do a, a thumb. Thumbs up or thumbs down. Oh, Laura has a comment here. Yes. So my point is that I don't believe that housing for a full range of households has to exist in every sector of the city. We don't need to have uh, housing for singles, couples, families with children and other dependents, extended families, non-traditional households and seniors in every single part of the city. And I don't know if I would be super in favor of saying, hey, we should have senior housing in industrial zones in particular, right? Mm -hmm. It's not that I'm against it, 
I'm just saying I don't want it to be a requirement or to be implied to be a requirement that there, you know, we are all in favor of house having, you know, um, I would not be in favor of saying you must demolish an industrial building in an industrial zone and, and turn it into uh, townhouses and duplexes, right? And I don't know if that's the intent, but I just don't know that these particular policies, they apply citywide. The Boulder Valley comp plan is broader even than the city itself. And I don't think it has to apply to every single sector within the city. That, that's all I'm saying. So I'm not sure the need to call this out in particular for an ordinance that is specifically about industrial areas. All right, uh, George. I, I actually argue the opposite. I think this is probably the biggest single issue that we face as a city. Um, and I think the, the idea of putting housing in places like um, the subcommunity plan that was just approved is exactly for that, is, is, to, is to accomplish the goals in the plan and, and to find housing for everyone. Um, so I, I, I see this as paramount for city planning um, across the city. Mark. So I just wanna clarify, you would want to take a note, 7.10, 7.07, and add them to PDF page, uh, the, the packet page 55, tw page 21 of the memo and insert those two between economic, economic policy 5.14 and housing policy 7.11. Is that where you want to put this in the memo? So you want to add just, it would just be like the memo as it is, insert these two policies in the memo and we're done. Okay, thank you. That's a, that's a yes for those who didn't see Sarah's nodding. It, okay. Can you say that page number again, please, Mark? It is <clears throat> page 55 of the packet and it should be labeled page 21 of the memo, just so you make sure you're on the right page. But it's 50, page 55 of the full packet. So uh, Laura, are you uh, preparing to make a comment or? I'm going to make a question that I don't expect to be answered, but if we are saying that housing for a full range of households, this policy uh, applies in industrial areas, are we also willing to say that it implies in areas that are currently single family zoned? Because that's what I think you're implying is that these policies need to happen everywhere in the city, regardless of what the current zoning or current intention is. Why don't we cross that bridge when we get to at least, uh, Laura, this is a conversation about housing in industrial zones. That is what I'm saying, but I get yelled at. <laughs> <laughs> but we're not talking about that right now. Um, I think just from a procedural point, um, I wanna make sure before we move forward, and I, I hope that we've done a good job of this, that everyone feels like they've got to express where they're coming from, what they're thinking about and, um, you know, doesn't feel shut down. And then to me, this seems like a spot where as long as people aren't feeling not unheard or, or like there's things that need to be said that this is a good time to do thumbs and kind of move on. Like, it seems like a good spot because we've kind of see where we're falling. There is a degree of disagreement. I think that's, will be reflected, you know, in the minutes and it'll be read in and it'll show up. Um, and maybe it's a good time to kind of keep rolling and see what other things we agree or don't agree on. Got your point. Um... Okay, let's let's do some thumbing here. Everyone who agrees with uh, Sarah's suggestion, let's see your thumbs. I'm just I can't. Oh, George, Sarah, I, I it's blocked. I can't see the. Okay, one, two, three, and uh, Mark, was that a thumbs down? No. That's a that's a sideways, which I, oh, sideways. Our I facilitator just, was okay. I would um, consider a thumbs up on seven point oh seven, and 
I would be thumbs down on 7.10. 707, I, I, um, I feel like that, uh, and, and to Laura's point, we need to adopt 707 everywhere. And so if we adopt it tonight uh, in the memo uh, going to council, then uh, it, it, it gives us further uh, ability to adopt it everywhere. I mean, okay, if that I, is a I, bargain I, that we're willing to strike, <laughs> then I could be persuaded to support this. Again, but I think people making, are trying to separate those questions, Mark. We're not making an agreement on residential area. When this is a this this is what I think Mara would call a process coup. The parameters <laughs> the parameters are not residential areas across the city. We are talking about industrial areas and adding residential to it. That's that's tonight's conversation. Yes, we will I understand. The Okay. I understand. I'm just bringing up the broader implications of the conversation. I don't expect us to resolve them all tonight. Okay. Um, right. Well, and and just to revisit, so regardless of any broader conversation or where it applies elsewhere, and I agree that, that this is not the time or place for that, although it's good to air some of that. Um, so you're both comfortable with including 707, but not 710? Is that what I heard from you guys? Are you asking me as one you of you and guys? Mark? Yes, the two folks who are either sideways or down. No, I, I don't think these need to be included. I'm a down. And not okay. because I don't love these policies. I just think they already apply across the city. Cool. And I don't think that we need to specifically include them in this particular ordinance. Awesome. Um, what what are, I'm sorry, I wasn't here at the very beginning. Are we actually voting on anything or just giving direction to staff? Like, I'm not direction, we don't direct staff, but are we giving feedback to staff or, or like, are we, do you have, actually have to take a vote? Uh, we're giving feedback to staff. Cool. I bet staff has heard their the feedback on this item. Just a reminder, the purpose is to vote on a recommendation to the city council for this. Yes, and so if we get to the point of writing a recommendation with this language in it, I think we know where people stand, that four people will say yes and three will say no, or excuse me, um, at least one, at least one is not going to say yes. And Mark is a question mark. Okay. He, he agrees That's with half uh... of it. Sarah, you're uh, recording numbers of thumbs here. Okay. All right, let's move on. So, uh, Lisa, can you, okay, you're putting up the, okay. Are there any other uh, uh, concerns of, uh, with respect to the big picture Boulder Valley comp plan? Uh, in this uh, in this matter, I think Sarah made a, a very uh, useful suggestion. There may be others that uh, that you have, other members have. Hearing none, we'll move on. Uh, can you go to the next slide, Lisa? Thanks. Okay, now we're going to deal with these uh, specifics here and hear discussion and concerns about. Uh, each of these uh, aspects that staff has come with a suggestion on. Mark? I'm sorry, did we go past question two? I mean, we were talking about question one, BBCP. Yes. Or are we on question two now? And this is- We're on question two. Gotcha, okay, all right. Okay. okay. And so what are your thoughts about uh, residential uses here, the proposed changes? I'm for them. <laughs> okay. Laura. I am also for them. I want to point out that I think uh, staff heard our feedback last time about using the set adopted subcommunity and area plans as uh, as guidance, and I appreciated that, and I liked the way it was done, and I, I think that the way it stands now, I'm supportive. Okay. Sarah? George? Lisa, can't see your thumb there. Oh, okay, good. And uh, there's a thumbs up for me too. Congratulations, Lisa. Oops, there's going to be some do uh, car uh, pet noise here. 
Uh, Sarah, can you take over for a couple minutes? John, we actually can't hear your dogs. So if it's bothering you, that's one thing, but the Zoom, um, the microphone filters it out. Um, well, he's the, he's, all right. In, Lisa, I, I did have one quick question uh, on this kind of brought, you know, these segments is um, Lynn, Lynn brought up something um, I thought was interesting in public comment, which was about thrift shops. Do they, do they have a, do they have a function in, in this at all? Yeah, thanks for the opportunity to clarify that. Um, so thrift stores are, would be a retail store, uh, same with mining jars, like art supply stores. Um, so the, the proposal is to allow retail, retail stores in the industrial areas where they're currently prohibited. So thrift stores, uh, the, there would be a size limit, so they'd have to be small, uh, under 2,000 square feet. But yes, they would now be allowed in these areas. Okay. Thank you. Uh, John, John back? Yeah. Yes, I'm back now. Sorry okay. for the interruption. Okay. Um, so Mark. We, 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 oh, go ahead. I didn't, I was going to say, are we, we're all in agreement that the proposed changes for residential uses were A-OK -okay with us? Okay. So then, then we move to offices because George brought up thrift stores. So maybe John, you can take us through offices. Okay. Yes. I invite comments. Uh, Mark. John, I, I wonder, uh, and again, I had mixed feelings about mm -hmm. our uh, instructor facilitators use of negative polling, but we have a lot of things here on the screen and I am generally very supportive of the ordinance. And I'm wondering if this would be an opportunity for negative polling to find out who has a problem with on the board, who has a problem with the way the ordinance reads in regard to any of these areas? Well, I, that's a, a reasonable way to go ahead. So does anybody have problems with what's being proposed for the office uh, regulations here? Lisa. Oh, that's my own little indicator there. Sorry. Okay. All right. So let's do a thumbs on uh, offices. Are we all in uh, happy with what's being proposed? Okay, Lisa. Good for you. Research and development uses. Any concerns there? Oh, Mark. I I, I'm not sure where this would go. I, I think I have a typo that I want to call out. And so <laughs> do it, do it now. <laughs> In the ordinance itself, on page 61 of the packet, um, under uh, 4B, industrial hyphen general, uh, it goes, one of the changes after service industrial uses, it says media, comma, storage, comma. Media is like, it should say media production. It shouldn't say just media on its own. Media is not an industrial use. Media production is, but media is, is incomplete. And everywhere else, I started actually doing a little search Everywhere else in the memo and everything else, it refers to media production, but in that particular edit, it just refers to media and it confused me until I started to go through the rest of it, noting it was media production. So uh, does that seem reasonable concern, Lisa? Yeah, it does. Thank you for the attention to detail. Appreciate that. And we can make that change. Okay, let's do some negative polling here. How do, uh, any concerns on, uh, on the uh, research and development uses? See, I'm, I'm not seeing Laura there. No, none from me. So, okay, I just wanna make sure I'm not uh, bypassing you. Thank you, John, I appreciate yeah. that. Okay, restaurants, special thoughts? <laughs> All right, 
live work units. Sarah. Thanks. So back, to, so this is why I asked the questions. Um, I think live work units in terms of housing diversity make a lot of sense and are appropriate, certainly for industrial areas. And this proposal expands where they can happen. But I, I do have a concern that they won't be used the way they're intended. And um, so my proposal, I think my proposal would be um, just making them conditional. So when they're developed, they're the develop the applicant ha is the is the entity that has to deal with the conditionality. Um, and then the business license that apparently exists separate from the land use process would be the in, would be an in, uh, enforcement mechanism, I suppose. So, because uh, my worry is just that you'll end up with what are essentially townhomes when what we intended was this sort of interesting mix where you really have these 15 minute, these lived in 15 minute neighborhoods. So I'm just trying to address that by proposing that they be conditional um, across. I mean, I think the way they are in the use table, it's allowed every, uh, it's expanded, the, the allowances are expanded. So maybe it's just in the industrial areas that it becomes conditional. I don't know. I'm curious what other people think or what, what staff would, would, what their feedback would be. Laura. I guess I, I just have a question. Like my assumption is that a live work unit, there's something about the build that enables the work function. It's not just, uh, I have a townhouse and I sit at my computer and just like any other house, but there's something different about the build out. There's a commercial kitchen or there's a workshop or there's a, you know, something about the space and the way that it's built out that makes it a live work unit. Is that true or could a live work unit just look like any other house? Uh, I can clarify. Yeah. yeah. So that's kind of getting back to the differentiation between what a home occupation would be and what a live work unit. And it is that there would be some kind of form that makes the work unit a principal use as well. So it's not necessarily smaller than the residential use. Um, typically, you would see this or how we've seen it develop in Boulder so far as like a ground floor or gallery or studio or something and then above would be residential. As it's written now, there aren't specific form standards, but that's something certainly we could add in. Um, if that's something we want to um, add to the standards for live work or, or the definition um, makes more sense in the standards, but we could add in some more descriptions uh, or standards for how that form should be to differentiate it. So yeah, I guess question? I, it does answer the question. I don't know that I have the solution necessarily. I mean, I, I agree. I understand Sarah's issue and wanting to make sure that if it is a live work unit, it is actually a place where people both live and work and that there's something special about being able to work in that space that is not just another house. I don't know what the answer is. I would not want to overly complicate uh, and therefore be a deterrent to developing live work units. And I don't know if making it a conditional use runs that risk. So I guess I would invite creation, creative suggestions from staff and maybe that is the best way but what is the best way to you know avoid misuse of that space if that is indeed a problem like if that is a real uh, a fear that you know there have been cases of that and there could be more of it so that's what i wanted to ask about um am i correct or does staff know of hand i was thinking of is it steel yards that has some live work um, and I, I assume that, I don't know, I mean, I assume we're not auditing, like, who's doing what or using what, but do we have any kind of a sense of if people are, like, moving a roommate into their alleged studio space or, you know, if it's actually being used as an artist studio or other workshop, or do we have any sense of kind of how it's gone elsewhere? Yeah, I haven't heard of enforcement issues or anything, like, pointed out where those are not, the work function isn't being used. I think um if you you know walk around those areas you might not see a lot of activity on some of those work units that might not necessarily mean that there's not something going on there that um the business maybe has you know only specific hours or something um but no we don't have specific data on those existing live work units but it it isn't something that's been raised as an issue where we have live work units already um some other examples like the Velo condos is in industrial 
that were um, just recently built. Those have some lid work as well. Are, are just this is a uh, kind of similar point of clarification. Are they are they taxed differently than a typical residential unit? Um, because we have different taxing policy for commercial and residential. I'm just. I don't know the answer to that, but I can look into that. People who do. Yeah, because I would imagine that alone would 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 kind of put a pause on someone just using it as residential if that was the case. Yeah, I mean, if if that's how we handle it, then I would assume that that would yeah make you not want to treat it like just an extra room in a house. Because why pay the taxes if you're not using it for commercial function? Well, so it be more tax lucrative to George, it's a great question. The taxes are paid through the business license that you're required to have as either a home occupation or a, um, live work, if that's the case. No, I was I was thinking on the property tax side of things. Yeah, that wouldn't be taxed differently for okay. um, from a residential unit. Correct. Yeah. Got it. So maybe so, the. Sorry, John. Yeah, I, I, I would put in that I think I'm. I like the concept of live work units, but I'm unclear that enforcement is actually uh, taking place uh, at the moment. And I think that it is appropriate at this point to point out that we believe, if if that's true, if the majority thinks so, that this should be considered and. Uh, and uh, dealt with uh, to make sure that there's proper use of that space. I agree, and I'm also open to kind of, and I don't, you know, Laura, tell me if I'm paraphrasing you wrong, but I don't know that I know what the most elegant solution is. Like, I, I think, I, I don't know what we need to, you know, pass on and, and you know, make, maybe we need to get really specific tonight, but if we were able to give guidance to staff or not get super specific, like the property tax issue is maybe an elegant solution, you know, I, I, I'm not dead set on any particular thing, but it does seem to me like having some form of either by virtue of the use, there's a bit of a minor penalty that you pay for not using it appropriately that dissuades people from misuse or some form of an enforcement or something seems smart because otherwise it'd be really easy to just use it as residential, right? And then we're not getting the activation and, the, and even the industrial character is being more lost because it's actually just converting to residential. Um, which isn't the intent. Sarah. Oh, well, Mark had his hand up first. Oh, go ahead, Mark, sorry. Um, to try to solve this, um, like almost everything else in Boulder, uh, we could simply adopt a complaint basis um, policy, which is really how we operate on almost everything from noise ordinances to parking violations to any, any number of things. Um, I would be opposed to trying to uh, force a 4X four, four property tax on, you know, talking about affordability, uh, you know, property taxes on commercial properties are 4X what they are for residential. So uh, I, I do not want to see anything put in there that, that would jeopardize uh, the affordability of having a, it labeled as a residence rather than a commercial unit. Finally, um, <clears throat> it seems as though, uh, you know, we're kind of envisioning an abuse that if it's really abused, then, then we can either uh, allow planning staff to deal with it, get a complaint, or if it's rampant, then we, in, then we uh, subsequently adopt some additional enforcement mechanism but anyway i i'm i think the overriding concern is getting some live work units in our ig zones for me that's that's mine sarah so um i just really interesting conversation um uh one of the things i heard when i was um listening in on the um the community work part of the working group was there were a number of folks representing the or a handful of people representing the arts community and for them the live work structures um, was very appealing because it allowed them to have their studio and gallery um, in the same built same places where they worked 
So I think that there's a real value to this type of housing. And I also think that it's a type of housing that would easily be taken up and not used the way it's intended. And so I, I, I hear what Mark said about not wanting to have a property tax mechanism uh, solu uh, be this, this solution. Um, but I also have a problem with um, complaint based because we all we've all complained about various and sundry things, and the city has a um, it's not really the best way to go. It's not the most neighborly way to handle things. So um, uh, I, I think the idea of specific form standards is in, an interesting tool and one that we could hand back to staff to develop. Um, and I also think making it conditional. Again, it's uh, it that's only that only impacts the developer. It doesn't impact the um, ultimate purchaser or renter because that person would be governed. If I'm understanding this correctly, Carl, by the business license. Is that correct? Okay, so it wouldn't put an additional burden on the ultimate owner or renter, but it would put. Um, um, uh, responsibility on the developer who is the person with the deepest pockets to begin with. Um, so I, that's that's all I wanted. That those were my comments. George. Um, you're muted, George. <laughs> Sorry, um, I, I agree with both Mark and Sarah here. I've actually looked at some live work units in the past and actually just looked up a definition and maybe maybe staff can just um, take a look at this because when 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 it's defined, when you actually look up the definition of a, of a live work unit, it's actually pretty interesting. A small, medium sized, two to three story attached or detached structure containing one dwelling unit above or behind a fire separated flexible ground floor space that can accommodate a range of non residential use. Um, so I think that's really interesting. And that's what I've seen in some live work where they're actually defined by, by, a, by a fire separation, the upstairs and the downstairs, because you have different uses. So I don't know if that's how it's set up in our code today, but maybe, maybe staff can either take that or give us feedback or whether, whether or not that's correct or not, but that's, that would be one clear way to define what this is. Yeah, so that's not something we have currently in the definition and that's not in the proposal. So that would be a very clear form standard or a form um, description that we could add to the definition. So that would be easy to incorporate. Hey, George, could you um, can you send that to um, Amanda so that maybe we can add that language or put that language in um, and as part of something we vote on? Uh, yeah, I mean, my, my only concern is I don't know whether that's the exact solution, right? Because I, you know, I, I don't profess to be an expert in that. Um, it just happens to be a definition that's available. That's sort of like the first thing you look up. That's the definition. So yeah, I'll send that to Amanda. Okay, uh, Laura. Yeah, I'm appreciating this conversation, and I just want to check in with staff about, you know, we, we do not want to have the unintended impact of making live work units. Uh, unbuildable because they're too expensive, too complicated. They don't have the profit margin. You know, there's some uh, perverse impact here where we're trying to encourage live work units. We don't want to see them used for the wrong purpose, but we do want them to get built. And um, so I just want to just check in with staff and get your, your sense of whether what, you know, what could we propose of the things that we have talked about? What could we propose that you think would not be a deterrent to actually getting these things built? That's a great question. So I think that some more clarity about the definition based on this conversation would be helpful about the form of what a live work unit, what, what, when we're talking about live work unit, what we mean. And I think the above and behind language helps. Um, also regarding uh, the idea of changing it to a conditional use in some or all of the districts, for the most part, that would still be more permissive than what we do now to have conditional use because it's just prohibited in most districts. And actually in the industrial districts, except IMS, it's a use review right now. So uh, that would be, you know, the kind of step is allowed conditional use review. So conditional would be an easier process. It's an administrative review um, in industrial also. So that's kind of a, um, that would be an, I think an appropriate solution that would 
um, maybe give us more teeth on the enforcement side, um, but still be more permissive of these types of uses around the city. Thank you. So See, what, well, oh, I, I, I have a comment uh, response to something that Mark said. Uh, and I, I don't want to complicate the discussion, but obviously this is what happens when you start out with a sentence like that. I'm not sure that uh, we want to be in the game of subsidizing uh, businesses because they're not paying their taxes the way they other business have to in a live work unit. Uh, Mark made the, the point out of trying to give people a break and not make them pay commercial taxes. But if there if there's commercial activity taking place in a in an in an area that is formally designated for that. It's not obvious to me that A, it's appropriate for us to be talking about tax issues at all. But secondly, that it's appropriate for us to trying to for to try to help people avoid paying commercial taxes if if they're using an area for commercial purposes. So I, I'm very cautious about using that logic to to affect our considerations tonight. Mark? So I would say that uh, my wife is an artist. Her studio is at home. She sells her work. Uh, <clears throat> we operate a real estate business out of our home. We do not pay commercial taxes on our home, nor would I expect an artist living in a live work unit to pay commercial taxes because they paint on their lower level of their of their live work unit, um, and you know again affordability is a key element. And I find a distinction, a clear clear distinction between someone an artist or a tradesperson. Um, I'm sorry, wrong word there. An artist or a craftsperson uh, making a sculpture in their live work unit as completely distinct from a gallery on the Pearl Street Mall. Those are, those are they're both dealing with art, but they're very different. And, um, but they both might require a business license. I, I actually really like George's idea of defining live work units by form um, and, and then kind of letting it go at that. And that, uh, that if you make the workspace um, something that is truly hard to be some hard to be a residential space, then all right, great, you've got a workspace and um, you'll have you'll be competing with other artists or craftspeople to, uh, to get that sort of space. Anyway, that's, that's my thought. I, I actually like the idea of defining them by physical form. George. Uh, yeah, I'll try to make this short. I, I kind of a, a agree, agree with Mark where, and, and it's, it's and, and you, John, quite frankly, I just don't think that tax is necessarily our purview. I, I don't think it is. I think that this, the city has the structure for live work already in place. I wouldn't, I wouldn't look to, you know, my, my question was sort of innocent as to how it was set up. Um, I think limiting it to by form in a very simple way, I think it's probably done in other cities today, um, looks that way. Um, I also think of live work spaces as relatively small. Um, so, you know, I guess that would be the other factor. I mean, are we, are we, are live work units, you know, a 2000 square foot, can, can, a, can a 2000 square foot restaurant sit underneath a live work unit? I, I would think not, um, but I don't know how it's defined for Boulder, and I think that that would be interesting um, because at the end of the day, I think the idea is to serve the types of people that Mark is talking about, the guy who's repairing bicycles, the artist that has a little thing, the chiropractor that might have a, an office underneath and see patients and those types of things. And I, I think that's different, but, but, but it's probably limited square footage. It's probably fire separated. Um, it, it probably, the probably, is what exists today already in our live work units, uh, by and large. That's that's all. 
So can I just summarize? Oh, can I summarize what I'm hearing? Um, I am hearing that there seems to be some agreement on uh, asking staff to get clarity around the definition of live work through um, form and standards and some agreement, maybe not complete on uh, changing it from an allowed to a, con of a use review to a conditional use in industrial zones, which would not impact um, other zones, which would just go by the form and standards. Is, is that what I'm hearing? from everyone, is there anyone who's like, absolutely not, that is not what was said? I'm happy with it. Okay, all right. Um, can I just ask a question before we move on? So um, uh, who is our lawyer today? Elliot, Elliot, do we um, need to draft a friendly for to capture this or how, how do we capture this so that what we're voting on include what we will be voting on includes those two ideas? Right. Yeah. So there's there's multiple ways you could do it. You could guys could um, formalize this recommendation with a formal vote right now, or once you've done the thumbs, uh, essentially like we could we could do this now and like make recommendations in a series before the final motion or we could do them all in conjunction with the final motion, whichever uh, is to your preference, I suppose, or whichever you think would be clearer. Okay, so maybe we do thumbs first, so we know that we're, I said the right thing, and then um, everyone can decide together if we wanna come back to this and add it after we, okay. So John, take it away. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I think uh, we'll do a thumbs up on what uh, on the form and uh, conditional conditional and then uh, that I think that will be sufficient at this point. Okay. So all right, show me your thumbs. Are, are we all I'm just looking I don't see Lisa here. But uh, Lisa, is your thumb Lisa, up? Her Lisa's thumb. a thumb. She's <laughs> double thumbing. Okay, good. Okay. All right, let's move just on. Off, I'm just off your screen, I think, John. <laughs> okay, all right. And uh, just to conclude, I, I don't think planning board should be getting into the tax game either. But I think when we are making decisions that imply a subsidy to certain groups, it's good for us to be explicit about it. But anyway. That's, we don't need to discuss that further here. Okay, indoor athletic facilities. Any I love thoughts? them, no problems. I have no problem with it. Anybody else? Thumbs, show me your thumbs. All right. Breweries, wineries, distilleries. Uh, one thumb up there. Okay. I think we're all okay with that. And uh, private schools. Special concerns. Sarah, do I see a thumb? Okay. All right. We're all okay with that. Um, and then updated definitions and names. Okay, and uh, removed uses or definitions. Okay, I think we've gone through the list. Mark. I just wanted you? to make a comment that I really appreciate uh, staff's work and the difficulty of removing and condensing versus adding as evidenced by our conversations tonight and all our meetings, I, 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 as I went through this ordinance, I was impressed with uh, the willingness and ability to just go ahead and strike stuff. And I appreciate that. So that's, that's my only comment during this section is uh, they did a good job with that. 
Okay. All right. So let's see. Our next step is to, uh, I think Sarah has recorded uh, our. I think our next step actually, are there any other issues? Any additional issues that were not, um, that you all, anyone wanted to put on the table that were not covered um, in this, in the um, list put up here by Lisa? I see a bunch of shaking heads here. I don't see any. Sarah, did you have any? Mm -mm. It just, it, Mara said that was the one thing we wanted to ask. <laughs> okay, yeah. All right. So I think uh, what we need to do is put together a motion that we can uh, vote on. So, so I just want to say that if we do one single motion, that's going to be hard for me because I was supportive of some of the changes, but not others. And so if you pack them all into one thing, I think we should we should be able to say we recommend the ordinance and then, you know, five out of six of us recommended this and all of us recommended this other thing. We should be able to give that kind of level of detail to city council. I don't want it to be just one motion where I have to vote down on the whole motion to not vote yes on everything. OK, I think uh, Elliot may have some wisdom for us. Yeah, I, I agree with Laura's suggestion there. I think that's a great way to delineate um, which board members are in support of uh, which which aspects of the ordinance. Okay. So, so maybe the way to do it is make the motion that's been proposed by staff, and then we have two friendlies. One is the adding 707 and 710 to the charter component of the packet. Is that the right way to say it, Lisa? Wait, I can't hear you. Oh, to, to the memo that goes forward to city council. To the memo. Okay, sorry. And then, uh, and then the second would be, the second friendly would be, I don't know if this language covers what we said, but um, recommend development of form and standards specifically defining live work spaces and make live work a conditional use in industrial zones. Does that, does that capture what it was from a planning language perspective, Lisa, does, is that appropriate? Yeah, I think for the form, you could just say add form, uh, form descriptions to the definition. Okay, recommend adding form descriptions, defining descriptions, descriptions for live workspaces. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and making live work a conditional use in industrial zones. Yeah. Okay, all right. I, um, Amanda, I'm going to send both of these to you via email. And and I do think that you could, the, the stuff that we all agree on, I think we could package in one thing, that we recommend the ordinance plus the piece about the live work units, and we can pass that unanimously. And then the second one, make that a separate, here's our recommendation about the memo that goes to city council and have a separate vote on that. I think we all agree on the ordinance. It's the memo piece that is um, not 100%. I actually like having the live work unit separate, even though we might be unanimous on it. I, I like keeping the initial motion of staff. And then I think it brings attention to the two distinct uh, adjustments to the uh, proposed ordinance. So I would actually like to see three us vote on three things. <laughs> That, that's fine. I don't. I, that's fine with me. Okay, let's me, let's do let's do three and uh, make everybody happy. Then, Mark, would you like to? Uh, wait, 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 make John, John, Denny, John, John, John. What? I need. I I don't know if you guys. I need um, one more minute to get this stuff oh. to Amanda. Hold on. <laughs> well, actually, I, while you're working on that, might we? It seems as though the way I'm reading things that the staff's motion would be a unanimous yes. Yes, but I'd still like the minute to just to do this. Okay. Because Amanda's going to need to. <laughs> let's, let's take a brief two minute break. Get up, fill your water bottle, take a okay. breather. Let's let Sarah work. 
Okay, I'm calling a break. Come back at 8.55. Awesome, thank you. And hey, John, I'd be happy to make this motion to support okay. staff's ordinance here because I think they did a bang up job and I want to be the one to, you know, make the motion. All right. Amanda, are you there? Perchance, hi. So I just sent you two separate, um, super simple language, um, two separate pieces of language. Um, okay, great. Um, but I, I don't know if they have the correct, um, I, we'll have to get um, Elliot to make sure that it's phrased or sure. introduced in the right way because I just don't sure. know. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I'm a little unfamiliar with um the language for a for a friendly. <laughs> as long as the intent is is clear, we should we should be good. Okay, okay. so maybe Elliot, when, when the board talks about it, you can chime in if something needs to be added or taken out or. Yep, I'll, I'll definitely flag it if it's not clear. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I am now going to. <laughs>
Okay, are we uh, slowly shuffling back into the room here? Yeah, I guess so. Okay. I think uh, Laura had wanted to make the first motion. Yes, please. Um, so I move to recommend that City Council adopt Ordinance 8556 amending Title IX Land Use Code to update the use table and use standards related to industrial uses and districts as part of Phase Two of the Use Table and Standards Project. Okay, do we have a second? I second. All right. Okay, all in favor? Oh, Sarah has a point to make, I think. Well, I just think our process, this is where we always get flummoxed. I think the process is we have to make the friendlies before we vote on the whole ordinance. Is that not correct, Elliot? Um, we're making I, friendlies. I, we're making friendlies, so they have to be made before we approve an amendment, I mean, approve an or approve a motion, don't we? You know, candidly, I'm not I'm not clear on that exact procedural point. I think your intent is going to be uh, clear to the to the city council, regardless which order you do it. But if you prefer to make the friendlies first, I think we're you'd be well within your I, I think that's to do the that. Way I well, but I'm the motion maker and I don't necessarily want to agree to those friendlies. I think it's just make three separate motions, right? Yeah. Like separate them completely. As the second, I concur with Laura. Well, wait a second though, because yeah. I think I think the procedural question here, in that case, we, we're gonna vote it down because the problem is that if we adopt it exactly as written, then we're missing the nuance of the stuff that we're doing, but but I, I see I see that Brad has chimed in, so I'll stop talking, Brad. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think maybe we're mixing up two concepts. One is making a friendly amendment to a motion, and one is making a motion. You, you actually have, as as drafted here, you've got three different motions that you could have three different votes on. A friendly amendment would be uh, somebody saying, "Original motion maker, do you want to change?" the word from update to update and inform or something like that. And then the original motion maker would say, oh, sure, that's fine. And then you'd move on. So we've effectively uh, split out the pieces where we had some lively discussion and where we have some um, new and new, well, I think what will probably be a unanimous vote and then a possible split vote. Um, but we've effectively split those out. So the original motion now no longer includes that. We've teased it apart so that it doesn't have to be addressed under the original. Yeah, I mean, as Elliot said, there are many ways to do it, but it, it, it seems that you've all set yourself up for three separate motions that you would have three separate votes on. Does that address your question, Sarah? If that's the way we're gonna do it, that's fine. Okay. Okay, so let's- I'm, still, I'm have... sorry, I'm sorry to, to get bogged down in this, but that's not the way I've understood everything we've done in the past. That's just not the way it worked. Every, every single vote that I've participated in, we've done a motion and then friendly amendments against it. Because as I see it, if we're adopting this individual motion then we're adopting the motion, and then these are separate things on top of that. And that's, that's, I, I, that's not what I'm signing up for. I mean, it's just a recommendation to city council, right? So they'll know we basically like the ordinance. We want to add but, to but it. Laura, what I'm saying is this is, again, this is like a process coup. This is not the way that planning board has functioned in every single vote. So if we want to change the way we want to function, then we need to vote on that separately because the way we function is the way that Sarah had mentioned it. Well, we function according to Robert's rules of order, according to the code, correct? And if you follow Robert's rules of order, a motion is made, you speak to the motion, you either agree to friendly amendments to the motion, people might make amendments, propose amendments, they get voted up and down. Finally, though, the, you can call the motion and you vote on the motion. And the motion might go up and might go down, and there might be subsequent completely different motions. 
So to me, if we want to talk about procedure, Robert's Rules of Order is the written into the code as our procedure. So this idea of, oh, we'll just call it a friendly has nothing to do as far as my knowledge of Robert's Rules of Order. I just my my whole objective here is that I do not want to have to do thumbs up or thumbs down on all three of these things packaged together because you know how I feel about the last one. So I want that one separated out. I want to be able to vote separately on that last one and not have it attached to the ordinance because I agree with the ordinance. I love the ordinance. I don't want that last piece attached to it because I, I don't think it's necessary. Am I going to die on that hill? No, but I mean, I hope you would respect my rights to, or my request to be able to have a separate signal to city council that I disagreed with just this one piece, right? I, I think that can be captured in the in the minutes, Laura. I'm I'm opposed to not making a friendly amendment. So if we want to go ahead and make the motion, um, then George, you're not amendment. respecting what I said, which is I don't want to have to thumbs up or thumbs down on the whole package together. I want to be able to separate out that piece. If you want to do the first oh, one, well, hold friendly, on, hold on a second. Don't say I'm not respecting what you said. I disagree with what you said. That's not a sign of disrespect. That's a that's a disagreement. That's fine, but you are making a process suggestion that would force me to do the thing that I have requested not to have to do. So you can frame that however you want, but I made the motion. If you want to make a friendly amendment to I will add make the it first friendly. piece. Since you made the motion, I'll make the friendly. What's your friendly? Um, my, my friendly amendment is to add these two additional things, which is to recommend adding the form descriptions for live work spaces, make live work a conditional use in industrial zones, and um, add BVCP 7.07 mixed use housing types and 7.10 housing for a full range of households to the memo component of the packet on page 55. So according to Robert's rules as the motion maker, I can either accept or deny your friendly amendment. I do not accept your friendly amendment. Oh my God. <laughs> no, it's not, oh my God, it's- It's Robert's it's rules. How it works. It's just how it works. If you want to add a friendly to add the first piece, I will accept that one. No, that's, if you want to make a non-friendly amendment, I forget what that's called. You can make a non-friendly, a hostile amendment. That's fine too. I think that's allowed by Robert's rules. I don't know exactly what that means mm -hmm. or how that works. We would need Elliot to explain it to us. George, I'm, 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 I'm trying to, to make the, anyways. George. I don't understand why you want to attach it all together and you are not okay with separating out that last piece so that we can have a separate vote on that. Because I don't, that, vote on the, I don't want to vote on the motion as it's put forward because I want to add these things directly to the motion. That's why, why I made the friendly amendment. Why does it all have to be attached? It's not a question because, because that's the process that we've run in the planning board since, the, <laughs> since every time that we've done votes like this. And, I, and, I, and I'm not voting on the amendment because of the same reason why you're why you want to vote for it individually. It's 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 not what I'm voting for. I'm voting for all these three things combined. If 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 these if if number two and number three were not added to that, I would not vote yes on the first part, Laura. So you would vote down this amendment if you cannot add the third part. The motion. So you would vote down the motion. I would vote down the amendment because it doesn't include these two items that are important to me. But you get to vote separately and give your signal to city council that you recommend those things. I, I think, I, I don't want to argue this anymore. Um, I've made my friendly amendment. And I have said no to it. So now what do we do? We call the, we, uh, call the question. How about we let the lawyer tell us? Yeah, I, I, I would like to hear Elliot's uh, input on this. Right, so the, so the motion's been made, it's been seconded, and now um, we, we could we could discuss the substance of the motion, which is the uh, original language as drafted by staff, or as Mark indicated, we could call the question on this on this motion. I'm 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 going to weigh in on that, and I think we should call it in a second. But I'm trying to figure out how I'm I'm going to vote on it because again, I think we're getting kind of lost in procedure, and I don't know that we're going to find the answer tonight. And I and I actually totally understand why both sides are confused and heated. Um, Jordy's point, I'm, 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 just, I'm, as I understand it, and I'm speaking as someone who's been on planning board for a long time, is that we are suddenly and on the fly, and I think maybe, maybe it's a great idea, 
but we're hearing from some of our newer members saying, hey, why don't we do this differently than we've ever done it before? And, and, and unfortunately, it happens to be falling on a night when Hella's not with us because Hella could has, has some institutional background knowledge. And so I don't think it's necessarily that one way is right or one way is wrong or one way is better and one way is worse. It's that we're suddenly changing the way that we're doing what we're doing in plenty word. And that's a completely valid thing to do, but it's happening in kind of a very contentious thing around something that I think it doesn't necessarily need to be so contentious. And so for me, like if the vote were called right now, I'm sort of torn because I, I don't, I don't really care. Like, I, I don't care which procedural path we take. It, it, it's irrelevant to me. And I think we end up at the same place in the end. So like, whatever, and it gets counsel what they need. However, I do understand the argument on both sides of like, hey, this is the way we've always done it. Why are we suddenly sh like making it different? And the other side saying, why do you care so much about these ossified rules and how you used to do it? And why can't I do it my way? Which makes me happier, which is a valid thing. and makes me feel like it's more clear and I can vote yes. I don't know that we're going to come up with an answer tonight, but I just want to call out that that's what I see happening. And I don't think it's actually that people are trying to get to a different endpoint. I think there's probably two totally valid paths. Um, and whatever way we vote, and I haven't decided what I'm doing yet, um, maybe not tonight, but I hope at some point we just decide which one we're going to fall in the future so we never have to have this conversation again. Um, and again, I don't really care which way, like not in a negative way. I just, I don't. And um, yeah, so. I'm but going people want to move but, something I, they can. But again, I just want to say, Lisa, you captured exactly what I'm saying, which is we're changing up the process on the fly to accommodate someone when we have we need to have the discussion as a planning board of what the process is if we're going to change it. Because this is the process that we've followed. And unfortunately, to your point, Hella is not here to clarify. But that's my understanding of the process that we followed. And, and it seems to be the understanding of everyone else that's been on planning board besides this year, that that's what we've done. And so if we're gonna change the process, I wanna have the conversation about changing the process. I don't wanna just arbitrarily change it to make someone happy. So, so again, I'm not, I wanna clarify here. I'm not just asking you to arbitrarily change something to make me happy. What I'm saying is I want to give a clear signal to city council that six of us, the six of us who are here tonight, support pieces one and pieces two, and that five of the six of us or four of the six of us or however many support piece three. However we do that is fine with me, but I don't want to have to say I either support all or nothing. And I don't think that's how you've operated in the past is that it's all or nothing. And so if somebody think, adds something, it's all or nothing on everything. And Georgie and Sarah stop me. Sorry, Brad, I'm, I'm going to say one quick thing. Georgie and Sarah, stop me if, if I'm remembering something incorrect from how we've done this in the past. But the way we've done this in the past is that we would do the thing, make the friendly, so direct the friendly, then everybody would vote on it and say, no, I can't vote for it because my friendly wasn't included. And then we would, the next thing we would do is introduce the three things separately or however we wanted to do it. So we'd, we'd like would reject the original one and then we would break it apart. And then we would do each of the pieces, which may or may not beautifully follow Robert's World Orders. I can see you, um, you know, uh, <laughs> and I love that you have a copy. That's wonderful. Um, uh, you know, but, but I, that's what I recall us doing is we would like call the thing, be like, we can't accept it the way it is right now, or we will, or we'll accept their friendly or we won't or whatever. And then we would like move it to more deliberation and like actually take the vote. Is that correct? And maybe Brad remembers, maybe Georgia or Sarah can correct me, but we kind of, or John, like we, we would just kind of like move through. Okay. This, like, I, I, I think we'll listen to Brad and we'll listen to Mark. And then I'm going to call a vote on the, uh, the motion with the denied uh, friendly. Brad? Yeah. yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I can confidently uh, offer up that I don't know how it's been done in the past. So I, I, do, I do want to respect that maybe there's been some history and discussion about this. H however, I might offer up um, just an observation of the realm of possibilities and that they may all um, lead to the same uh, result. One possibility is the original motion um, without the uh, additional clauses, I'll call them, A and B, uh, being voted on. Some people would vote for it, some might vote against it, and then they would express their reason for voting against it. Um, alternatively, uh, somebody might uh, offer up the original motion um, uh, 
without the uh, clauses added, that might get voted down, or I'm sorry, that might get voted up, and then people might still offer up the individual clauses to vote on. Um, there again, there would be an opportunity to explain uh, the purpose for, a, each person would be able to explain their vote in that case as well. Um, so I think, you know, if, if, if we consider the realm of possibilities, either voting it with the clauses A and B added on to it. So in other words, um, sorry, I've got the wrong document now in front of me. Uh, oh, I guess it's been taken down. Um, uh, sorry, I'm trying to do this off memory now. Uh, but, but I think you're both um, speaking to, yeah, thank you. So whether it's a motion to do just the original motion, I, again, some folks are going to want to make a separate motion, also recommending the form descriptions, also recommending the BVP, those who get voted up and down. Or again, the other possibility is somebody's going to make a motion with those already added. Some are gonna vote it up, some vote it down potentially. So, so I would encourage us not to get caught too much on, on uh, the options because they may all lead to the same consequence um, and all would be following Robert's rules. Um, I'll, I'll make one last statement too, that somebody might be tempted to call the question that too requires a vote of the group as to whether to close dis discussion and call the question as just a reminder of how that works. Right. Thanks. I appreciate you noting that uh, calling the question does not end debate. You actually vote to end debate. <clears throat> so, Laura. Mark, did you have more? No. Okay, uh, Mr. Chair, I would like to amend my motion. If if the second agrees. Okay. What? Uh, State your. Chin. I would. Okay. So I would like to add to my motion and so um, you can strike the period, add and, and bring that second clause up there and recommending adding form descriptions for live work spaces, make live work a conditional use in industrial zones. I, I think it's and, it should be a, rather than a semicolon there, it should be and make live work a conditional use in industrial zones. Mark, do you agree as the second? I do. Okay, that's my motion, is those first two things that only specifically relate to the ordinance. Whereas Sarah's motion does not relate to the ordinance, it relates to the memo component of the packet. So that's my motion relating to the ordinance. And it has been seconded. Does anybody want to make a friendly suggestion? I'll make a friendly um, and have that, but also add BVCP 7.07, .07, mixture of use housing types, and 7.10, housing for a full range of households to the memo component of the packet on page 55. I do not accept your friendly amendment, although I appreciate your, your good try there. Okay, so... So procedurally, we debate the motion as it is. All right. Any debate? I request your thoughts on this motion. Laura, your hand is up. Uh, no, sorry, that was a remnant. I'll put it down. Okay. Thank you, John. So uh, I'll speak to the motion. I support this motion because as evidenced by our prior, all of our prior discussions that uh, a majority, and in fact, I, I suspect the um, entire board that's present tonight can support this motion as it's made. And there's something to be said for unanimous uh, motions, uh, both in the way we convey our thoughts to staff and the way we convey our thoughts to council. And um, an opportunity to have a unanimous unanimous decision on a piece of work that encompasses years of staff time 
and a tremendous amount of good work uh, should not be dismissed lightly. And I think that um, uh, an opportunity to express your thoughts on additional amendments, changes, thoughts to council, I support the opportunity to weigh in on those. And I'm anxious to weigh in on that. But we have an opportunity for a unanimous decision and a, and a message to we have an opportunity to follow both the code and our stated procedures. The code calls out Robert's rules of order and, and it's, it is how we are supposed to work. Whether we have worked properly in the past or not, I can't speak to, but the code calls out Roberts and it gives us an opportunity using the correct procedure to have a unanimous vote. That's why I support this. Other comments? Uh, yeah, I'd like to make a comment. <clears throat> so um, I think it's unfortunate, honestly, that um, the motion maker decided that her needs <laughs> were more important than the needs of the board. And I will leave it at that. I would like to comment in response. Go ahead. And say, I, I don't, I honestly don't understand why you think I'm putting my needs above the needs of the board. I would like to be able to express a clear signal on what I support and what I don't support. And I support that for each of you as well. I don't, I don't understand why we would need to package this all together so that we force people to say yes or no to the entirety of it, knowing that some people support some parts and some people don't. That is a, a tactic. <laughs> I don't find it to be especially uh, collaborative or consensus building. I think, you know, that we, um, the goal is to give a clear signal on what this body recommends. And if we can agree on the things that we recommend, I would like to give that clear signal to council without having to say, I don't support an ordinance that I do support, that I absolutely support. I support staff's work. I support everything that went into this. I support the work of the subcommittee. I support the public input that went into this, all of the years of work that went into this. And I don't wanna have to say that I don't support that because I do not support a adding two policies to the memo that have nothing to do with the, well, that they, they complement the ordinance but are not part of the ordinance themselves. I don't wanna have to reject the ordinance because of the memo, and I don't want to have to accept the addition to the memo just because I support the ordinance. I'd like to give a clear signal on what I support and what I don't. And again, I support that for everybody here. And if we can use the process to give that clear signal, I think that is exactly what we are here to do. And I think that is exactly what council would appreciate. Um, and I don't, well, I don't see how doing anything different would help. <laughs> well, you have certainly made it clear how you want to use your tactics. So thank you very much for that explanation. Yeah, I, I'd like to speak, which is, um, I've been a member of planning board for two years. There are votes that I've voted down for specific reasons because something wasn't in what we were voting for. It didn't mean that I disapproved of everything that was in there. And I think that everyone on this board has done that in the past. And that when there is a vote down, that is also captured in the minutes of what people are actually voting down as part of that. I, I agree with Mark that there is an opportunity for a unanimous vote here, um, but the opportunity for the unanimous vote, at least for me, um, would need to include that last section. Um, and so um, that, that, that's, that's my viewpoint. That's also the way that we've done things. I'm open to changing our process but I don't want to have a process coup to do that. I want to have a conversation separate and apart from that. And my understanding of our process is we've done it is exactly what I've um, reflected in my statements. I, I object to the idea of a process calling it a process coup when it is actually the procedure and the code. It's a pejorative that's entirely unnecessary and brings an emotional quality into it that is, is, is inflammatory. It's not a process coup. It is the code and it is the procedure, period. 
and I will just say, I do not want anybody here to have to vote against something that they are actually for because it was packaged up with something that they cannot accept. I don't think that's good process. That is politics, right? And if that is the way the board has operated in the past, I think that there is an opportunity for positive change here. And, and again, I will say, I support every person here's right to clearly signal what they support and what they do not. But then, Laura, we'd have unanimous votes on everything on, on, and, and specify everything out that we've done in the past, which is not the way this board has functioned. That's the point. I'll just say that if I were a decision maker sitting on city council, I would want to know which bits of this have unanimous support and which bits do not. That, I mean, I think that's useful information for them. And that is what we are doing is making a recommendation to city council. So if you want to say that you do not support the ordinance as a whole, because you cannot have these lines added to the amendment, that is certainly your right. And I don't understand that choice. That's, that's but exactly I what I would, but Laura, that's exactly what I would say. At the end of this, if we were to vote on this, um, not in its entirety, that's exactly what I would say. And it would be captured in the minutes. And, and the signal would, to city council would be exactly that. That's how that's how it's worked in the past. I think we've identified a meaningful area for us to have further discussion, but I doubt that we're <laughs> going to figure this out tonight. Yes, I, um, I would like to said. invite the chair to call the vote. I'm calling the vote. So, oh, George, did you have an additional comment before we vote? No, okay. no, I'm all set. Thank you. All right. We have a motion in front of us. Uh, I'd like to, I'll, I'll call a roll call on this. Uh, we, we should read the motion. Uh, the motion is to recommend that City Council adopt Ordinance 8556, amending Title IX Land Use Code to update the use table and use standards related to industrial uses and districts as part of phase two of the use table and standards project and recommend adding form descriptions for live work spaces and make live work a conditional use in industrial zones. So, Lisa. Hey. Sarah. Can you come back to me, please? Okay, Laura. Aye. Mark. Aye. George. Aye. Sarah. Oh my I'll... God. Okay, I say nay myself. Oh my God. Uh, I will uh, also say nay and then offer to make another motion. Okay. Let's finish up this vote. I think we did, Mark. I think okay. everybody voted. We just did. Okay. Sarah? I'd, I'd like to offer a motion to recommend that City Council adopt Ordinance 8556, amending Title IX Land Use Code to update the use table and use standards related to industrial uses and districts as part of Phase Two of the Use Table Standards uh, Table and Standards Project. Um, and recommend adding form descriptions for live workspaces and make live work a conditional use in industrial zones and add BVCP 707, mixture of housing types and 710, housing for a full range of households to the memo component of the packet on page 55. Okay, do we have a second? I'll second that. Okay, discussion? So I will say, in an effort to make peace, I will vote yes for this, but I hope that we can seriously consider how we make motions and how we give signals to city council, because I do not support that last piece, but I will vote yes in the interest of group harmony and moving forward and hope that this is not a declaration of war. And I was not trying to initiate a process coup. I was simply trying to make a process that would allow us to send clearer signals to council. So I will vote yes on this, although I do protest and I will individually communicate to city council how I feel about that last bit. Thank you. Any other comments? 
Okay, I'll call the vote. George? I, I seconded the motion, so yes. Oh, okay. Mark? Aye. Laura? Aye. Sarah? Aye. Lisa? Aye. And I vote aye. Okay, thank you. That concludes this public hearing. And we will move on to the next item in our agenda, which is uh, an information item, I think. I'm trying to get back to my agenda here. Yes. So staff, would you care to take it from here? Good evening, Planning Board. I believe the, the information item is related to the access management and parking strategy. Chris Jones here, Interim Director of Community Vitality. I'm joined this evening by Sam Bromberg here to talk about the totally non-controversial topic of parking. <laughs> um, for those of you that have been on the Planning Board um, for a little while and or on previous on other boards, um, and commissions at the city, AMPS um, might be familiar to you. And you would recall that I showed up uh, planning board with Chris Haglin about a year ago to present the strategies that staff had been developing in partnership with a consultant team for uh, performance-based pricing for our on-street parking management, as well as a priority-based neighborhood access management strategy that we were seeking input before going to council for their um, hoped for support uh, for staff to be implementing those strategies. So uh, we did get council support on those two strategies. Um, they came with a lot of uh, um, action items that we have um, been implementing. One of those action items was to hire a fixed term uh, project manager and access coordinator, and that is Sam Bromberg. And so Sam has been with Community Vitality for uh, just about a year now, uh, working on implementing these strategies. So we wanted to come and give you all an update on this work um, that Sam's been leading. And uh, we are planning to go to council on November 3rd. We have some additional uh, work plan items to support the, the, the two strategies that we had presented last year, um, planned for 2023. And so we're here to share those uh, strategies with you. So with that, I will hand it over to Sam who has a PowerPoint presentation before we get into some questions that we have for you all. We can't hear you, Sam. Thank you. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Uh, give me just a second while I get my screen going. Can everyone see that okay? Yes. Sam, we're seeing your notes slides. Ah. The presenter mode. That is interesting. Hmm. Are you, is this working? I'm not. We're, we're, that's not in presentation mode yet. <laughs> okay. Can't click on it. Of course, this happens. I'm going to try one more time. I'm so sorry about that. How about now? <laughs> Try, okay, so so we're still seeing your notes slide, but is there at the very top an option for you to swap under display settings? There's a drop down on the very top. There you go. All right, is that? We're there. I'm not seeing my yes. notes anymore? <laughs> Correct, yes. Oh my gosh, sorry about that. Um, <laughs> It's late in the night and I've done this slideshow multiple times and this is the first time that's ever happened. So um, 
Of course it would. Um, hello, everybody. Thank you for having me tonight. I'm here to talk about access management parking strategy. Uh, I'll try and get through these slides quickly so that we can um, get to the discussion piece. Um, here is an overview of what I'll be talking about today. I'll take it back, give you all a little bit of background on how we got here today. We'll talk about performance-based pricing. We'll talk about the Residential Access Management Program, which is the program that uh, came out of the, the policy of uh, priority-based neighborhood access management. We'll talk about a new work group that we're recommending called Trail Access Management, uh, next steps for the program and um, questions that we have for the board. So access management and parking strategy in early 2014, an interdepartmental team of city staff began a new project called Access Management Parking Strategy or AMPS. AMPS was designed to be a guiding framework that balances today's multimodal access needs, trends and choices while also preparing for inevitable shifts in demographics, economics, travel choices, physical design and technology. This guiding document was adopted by council in 2017 and still plays a key role in shaping the work that is done today towards improving access to Boulder special places. Here are the current and ongoing AMPS initiatives outlined by the guiding document. This graphic visualizes the key ongoing projects related to AMPS, such as one of the first work items to emerge out of the process, which was the camp pilot. We'll be talking about parking pricing strategy, which is number two, and residential access management, which is number three. To build on the AMPS work in the areas identified for change, the City of Boulder's Community Vitality and Transportation and Mobility staff began the Revitalizing Access in Boulder project in 2019. The project set out to rework the city's parking products, including the existing neighborhood parking permit program and paid parking in our commercial districts to better reflect the AMPS vision. The community played an integral role in developing and refining strategies for parking pricing and permitting through a variety of engagement methods. Between polls and questionnaires, meeting with community organizations, boards, and commissions, over 8,700 members of the broad Boulder community with many varying viewpoints participated in the process. Ultimately, three strategies emerged as the best way to reflect the AMP's vision and goals. The, the three identified strategies were performance-based pricing, graduated and safety mobility fines, and priority-based neighborhood access management. In January of 2022, the first steps were taken towards implementation of performance-based pricing and graduated and safety mobility fines were fully implemented. Today, we'll be talking about performance-based pricing and priority-based neighborhood access management, a strategy which is the basis for the new residential access management program or RAMP. Performance-based pricing entails looking at existing supply and demand of on-street parking and adjusting pricing accordingly to better distribute parking across the available space. By pricing the in-demand blocks higher, we can encourage turnover and reduce cruising behavior of vehicles looking for parking. The intent is to provide a suite of parking options to the community so each parker can prioritize parking price, location, and availability based on their unique needs and resources. The strategy relies on key performance indicators to reflect the parking behaviors and adjust pricing as a reaction to parking demands. Implementation of performance-based pricing is expected to reduce overall VMT in Boulder, support increases in transit usage, increase CDM investment, and access for active transportation modes like walking and biking on high demand streets. This slide shows an excerpt from the new city manager role which introduces regulations for performance-based pricing. Rates will be adjusted annually in 50 cent increments based on measured occupancy levels. Based on the results, staff have determined that the downtown area is stable enough to implement performance-based pr pricing, but due to the changes in land use and ongoing construction in both Boulder Junction and University Hill areas and the readily available free parking nearby, staff do not recommend implementing performance-based pricing until the area is stabilized and can be addressed with the holistic management approach. For performance-based pricing in the downtown area, we examined data from the historically busiest months of April through August using transactional data from 2022. This map indicates those blocks where peak occupancy was above 85% in red, and those where peak occupancy was below 60% in blue. Temporary outdoor dining expansions from April through August of 2022 are, are indicated in yellow, and those blocks which fell within the target range of 60 to 85% and do not require any changes to price are indicated in gray. 
the highest utilized blocks and surface lots indicated in red will increase in price by 50 cents per hour, while those lowest utilized blocks in blue will decrease in price by 50 cents per hour. You will notice that parking utilization data is missing from the two blocks of Pearl Street between 9th and 11th due to the temporary closures. Historical data indicates those blocks are typically highly utilized and as such city staff recommends that they be considered for an increase. Additionally, there is utilization data missing for city employees who are permitted to park for free in the municipal lots between Canyon and Arapahoe through December of 2022. Although the map indicates that utilization for those lots is below 60%, it's likely that the actual number is higher. Staff recommend no price changes to those lots until future data can be collected. Lastly, the 1400 block of Walnut on the north side of the RTD station downtown is missing data from a coin meter head that was removed during the study period. Staff recommend no price change to that block until future data can be collected. Here's the results from University Hill um, to give you an idea of, of what we saw. We ultimately determined that it would not be a good idea to implement any changes in this area, but wanted to give you an, uh, a sense of what the data that uh, we collected this year. So we do see pretty high utilization on university, but um, overall pretty low in, in all of the rest of the area. And um, note that access is somewhat challenged right now due to those construction projects that are ongoing. And here's the results from Boulder Junction, um, which had a couple of, of issues, um, which we're hoping are well, we are hoping that will be resolved in the future. So we'll continue to collect data for those two areas, um, Boulder Junction and University Hill, um, to determine if there's any changes. But overall, utilization data was very low in Boulder Junction, and staff think it might be an issue with compliance there. Mark, did you want to pause for a question on no, one of these slides? I'm just getting a little background noise, and I'm not sure if someone's not muted other than you. Um, so anyway, I, I, that was all I was uh, going to do is ask. If everyone's not muted, go ahead and do it. Thank you. All right, so I'll switch gears a little bit and talk about the Residential Access Management Program. In a push to take a broad and active approach to manage parking and mobility behavior, the Residential Access Management Program, or RAMP, was introduced through the Revitalizing Access and Boulder work to build and expand upon the existing Neighborhood Parking Permit Program. RAMP-like performance-based pricing takes a data-driven approach to manage parking in our residential neighborhoods and is built on an annual assessment of the entire city based on key metrics such as parking occupancy, high trip generating land use, and resident or staff identified areas of interest. The goal is for the program to be more responsive to the individual needs of each neighborhood or area as opposed to the previous one size fits all approach of managed parking. The previous neighborhood parking permit program initiated in 1994 created the 13 zones that exist today. Most zones allow users without a permit to park for a limited time, typically between two and three hours once per day. The program's original intent was to manage spillover parking from activity centers like downtown into surrounding neighborhoods. Zones were created or expanded through a citizen-driven petition process followed by city review and a public hearing. The displayed map shows the Whittier NPP zone. Over the past year, staff have been busy building the RAMP program from the ground up, starting with the parking management strategies, which can be utilized under RAMP and the annual citywide assessment. This slide shows those strategies that are, uh, will become available to us under RAMP. Staff collected parking occupancy data from 38 unique study areas containing over a thousand block faces. This being a new program and having never conducted data collection on the scale, staff turned to a consultant for help with the data analysis. To understand the trends of parking occupancy, the data was analyzed by season, day of week, and time of day, resulting in 12 categories. In each category, the maps display the peak or highest observed occupancy. 
These occupancy trends will help staff and the public understand when these areas are most utilized. The end result is a tremendous amount of data which will help inform decision making and help staff track occupancy trends over the years to come. Staff have only just begun to study the results from this first year of data collection, but found that overall, the existing NPPs assist in keeping parking utilization below 85% in the managed zones. Certain blocks within the existing NPPs have peak utilization above 85%, mostly in the transitional areas, such as the residential blocks surrounding downtown. These high occupancy areas will continue to be flagged as priority A to determine if additional management strategies are needed. Staff also note noted that the blocks just surrounding several of the <clears throat> existing NPPs were flagged as being highly utilized and indicate that several existing NPPs may need to have their current boundaries evaluated to determine if any changes are recommended. Here we can see some of the key metrics for, uh, well, all of the key metrics for what thresholds need to be met for staff to consider adding a new managed parking zone or adding blocks to an existing managed parking zones. If it exi any existing zone do not meet key thresholds for three years in a row, they may, may be identified by staff for termination. Residents in existing zones may also petition for removal of the zone or part of a zone, which will trigger a review by staff. So our metrics are parking occupancy, visitation versus residents, looking at the cars parked on the street. Is this caused by a visitation to the zone or is this just residents parking on the street? Um, what is the zoning, whether it's predominantly residential in nature, um, whether there's any barriers to pedestrian movement. So what making sure that there's no arterials um, located in the middle of a proposed zone and the resident petition piece. Um, Staff so will also consider cost availability and proximity of nearby parking and transit options and impacts to adjacent neighborhoods. So we'll take a look at some of the existing neighborhood parking permit zones and surrounding blocks. Um, there's more detail in the memo that was provided, but just to give you a, a zoomed in idea of some of the results that we found. The sample is from the current Whittier NPP zone. This is from a typical summer weekday between 3 and 9 p.m. Overall, parking occupancy aggregated between all the blocks is between 50 to 70 percent, which is in the optimal range. But some blocks closer to downtown have a much higher occupancy and might benefit from additional parking management strategies. This map shows the results from the unmanaged blocks just outside of the current Whittier NPP zone. The results are from summer weekdays between 5 and 11 a.m. We can see that there is some parking spillover on several of these blocks. The data would suggest that we should take a closer look at this area, including expanding the scope of study to nearby additional blocks. Here are some of the blocks surrounding the general improvement districts where we also collected some parking occupancy data. So here are a couple of the blocks surrounding the paid parking area in downtown that are not already in an existing MPP. You'll notice it's not very many because many of the blocks that are surrounding the existing downtown paid parking area are already in, a, in an MPP, which is a neighborhood uh, parking permit zone. Um, some of these blocks are currently time limited parking, but this could inform how we might want to suggest that there, there's changes to the way that they're managed. These are the blocks surrounding the paid parking in the University Hill area, which helps explain why some of the paid parking blocks might have had much lower occupancy because they're all pretty parked up. And here are some of the unmanaged parking blocks in the Boulder Junction area abutting the paid parking blocks, where again, we see a decent amount of parking spillover. The original MPP program assessed the need for new MPP zones and extensions of existing zones based solely through the process of resident petition. Under ramp, residents can still request that their neighborhood be studied for possible inclusion in the new or existing MPP zone. 
Blocks identified through the petition process are automatically prioritized for study to determine whether parking mitigation may be necessary. And between the years of 2019 and 2020, while the city was still developing ramp, three separate resident petitions were received for MPP expansions. The petition expansions include a one block in addition to the University Hill MPP, one block to the Mapleton Hill MPP, and a 16 block addition to the East Aurora MPP. Following are the results from the three petition areas. Uh, this is a, a petition block for the Mapleton MPP. This is 2400 9th Street. We found that the block does not meet the KPIs to be considered for inclusion in the Mapleton MPP zone. Peak occupancy for the block was recorded at 57% during the fall to spring period of weekday mornings between 5 and 11 a.m. While visitors consisted of over 25% of park vehicles observed, the peak observed occupancy does not qualify the block for inclusion in an MPP. For the petitioned 700 through 800 blocks of 31st through 38th Street, this would be an expansion to East Aurora. We found peak occupancy during fall to spring weekdays during the hours of 11 a.m. and 3 p.m at 57%. The 57% peak is aggregated across all the blocks in the petition area. However, as is shown in the map, some blocks peaked at over 85%, while others were below 50%. Visitation to the area accounted for 24% of all park vehicles, which is just below the recommended 25%. This data suggests that this area might benefit from managed parking. And this is the pending petition for the University Hill. Um, this is 811th Street. Um, we found that peak occupancy was during fall to spring weekday evenings between 3 and 9 p.m. at 83%. It's important to note that the petition received for this expansion was solely for the west side of the block and was signed by nine residents of the five households of five households out of the seven on the block face, uh, which does not meet that KPI. Staff also determined that visitation consisted of 22% of the occupancy, which also does not meet the KPI of 25%. And of note is the building on the Northeast corner of 811th Street, which is a long-term rental with 40 rooming units. Um, so the data suggests that although measured occupancy levels are high, managing parking on this block may not reduce the demand for that available parking. So what is next for ramp? Now that we have our initial results in, staff can deprioritize certain areas that fell within optimal occupancy thresholds and focus in on the areas that fell outside of those optimal thresholds. The next steps will involve expanding the scope of the areas of interest to understand where the boundaries are and what possible solutions should be recommended. Staff expect this next stage of work to take place over the next several months and plan to return to boards with recommendations on those areas of interest next year. In the annual citywide study, RAMP aims to identify high trip generating public and community uses abutting or adjacent to residential areas such as open space access points at trailheads, which can create parking impacts to adjacent residential blocks. Historically, most neighborhood parking permit zones have been near traffic generating destinations such as downtown that already offer alternative modes of arrival beyond the personal vehicle. As RAMP expands its approach to look at access citywide, the neighborhoods adjacent to the highly utilized OSMP lands should be studied. Since many OSMP trail areas do not have access options beyond the personal vehicle, it would be OSMP users that would feel the impacts of any parking management implemented in those areas. As public use lands require special care, community vitality cannot operate without the involvement of OSMP as well as transportation mobility staff who bring relevant subject matter expertise to the table. Similar to the camp pilot, which brought together multiple departments to implement a project that accounted for parking management and public access, staff recommends the formation of a trail access management work group who can capitalize on the momentum from the upcoming camp evaluation to create a strategic plan and framework to guide future implementation of parking management and TDM strategies for impacted neighborhoods near OSMP trail areas. In 2022, OSMP staff helped identify a list of eight trailhead and access point areas based on visitation and mode of arrival data, 
within walking distance to residential neighborhoods and city limits. These staff identified locations were included in a preliminary ramp study to determine whether there are significant parking impacts on the surrounding neighborhoods. Overall, the initial results rate most trail access areas with lower optimal parking utilization. By creating this interdepartmental work group, we can further study these results to understand what other relevant studies or data should be accounted for in studying these trail areas, as well as factor in community concerns frequently heard from some of these areas. Here we can see the Sanitas and Dakota Ridge areas. There are 10 access points in addition to the Centennial Trailhead, which serves this area. Overall occupancy levels are between 50 to 70% at peak observed times. That's aggregated across all of the blocks. Um, those certain blocks are much higher than others, especially those closest to the Centennial Trailhead. The recently published OSMP phase one and two parking studies and identified Centennial Trailhead as having the second highest relative average percent occupancy for all trailhead lots with only Chautauqua having a higher occupancy based on its capacity. The study found that 57% of vehicles that entered the lot were turned away during peak periods. The Chautauqua area remains one of the most highly utilized areas and data collected will also help inform that camp evaluation being kicked off later this year by the Transportation and Mobility Department. So here are the next steps for trail access management and where they fit in with that camp evaluation. Um, you can see by where the pin is dropped on the road where we are in the process. So we've already identified the study locations and, and studied those areas this year. Um, and once the camp evaluation begins in the fall, um, next spring, the trail access management work group will start um, their process and determine what if any community outreach should be conducted and where additional study may be necessary for those identified areas. The camp evaluation should be wrapping up by the fall of 2023 and the lessons learned from the pilot can help inform how we can scale down effective management solutions to the less impacted areas. The trail access management work group will then develop recommended strategy and framework for addressing trail area spillover into residential areas based on measured impacts. And that's anticipated for next fall. Where we'll be coming back to the board to solicit some feedback. And here's our roadmap for all of our programs. Um, the next steps are, uh, we are in the process of developing a communication plan to inform the public of the upcoming changes that they'll be experiencing. The camp pilot evaluation begins this fall. There will be a scheduled increase in the neighborhood parking permit <clears throat> based on the, the previous recommendations of the revitalizing access and Boulder work. Um, at that time, we'll also have discounted permits available for income qualified residents. Uh, the trail access management work group begins planning out the year to come next spring. Performance based pricing is implemented downtown and data continues to be collected for University Hill and Boulder Junction and new and existing areas continue to be studied for ramp to determine where boundaries need to adjusting and what management strategies should be implemented. So here are my questions, um, which I'm hoping to solicit some feedback from, from board members. Um, hopefully you're, you're still with me and you're still awake. Um, before um, we go into the feedback, I'd also be happy to answer any questions that you might have or revisit any of the slides that I've presented. Thank you. So, board, you've heard the questions. Any response? Mark. I, I waited as long as I could in the hope that someone else would go first, but <laughs> uh, Chris and Samantha are both. Uh, I've talked to both of them today. And so um, my, my first comment is one that I made to Samantha today that um, I appreciate the amount of work that's gone into this plan. And uh, my comments, parking is something that I've been involved with 
before my time on TAB, and it was particularly um, uh, educational, and I'm passionate about it from my time on TAB. So there's a there's I have a bunch of questions, and so I'm going to start. But I, I I would really love other board members to weigh in, and I know the hour is late, but uh, I'm going to go until I, I feel uncomfortable, and then someone else can weigh in. So I have some questions first. Um, my understanding is that um, the NPP program, the NPP slash ramp program uh, does not pay for itself. And I made that comment uh, at the last time uh, Chris and Samantha were at our meeting. Does any part of our parking uh, system generate positive revenue uh, that we can actually point to, yes, revenue from auto parking has helped this transit goal, has helped this VMT reduction goal, and, and these monies have gone to these other, these other areas. Thanks for the question, Mark. I'll keep it really short. Um, parking revenues, and as you can see now in our brand new OpenGov budgeting, uh, online budgeting tool, parking revenues um, in uh, 2022 were projected to generate about $10 million a year. Um, our citations generate about $1.8 million a year. Our NPP program, I think, uh, Sam, correct me if I'm wrong, I think it costs us just over $200,000 a year. So it's a very small portion of our overall um, parking program, but enforcement in neighborhoods is much more challenging and produces a lot less citations than a downtown commercial area with high turnover um, and paid parking. And so that's where, as we've looked at the data, the amount of, of staff time that it takes to both create, implement, and manage a, a neighborhood program is very different than a commercial area. And so we've been trying to reconcile that over time. And that's why we're raising um, the residential permit uh, prices because it's just, it's it's very different from our, our downtown or commercial area operations. Um, of course, a lot of our uh, revenues in uh, uh, downtown University of Boulder Junction go to purchasing uh, universal bus passes for um, all full-time employees in all of those areas. In Boulder Junction, we, we pay for bus passes for residents as well, because it's part of the, the taxing district out there. We also pay for um, B-cycle memberships, car share, um, uh, other transportation uh, supportive um, options, because we know having built uh, seven garages over the past uh, 50 some years, that the only thing more expensive than providing all of these TDM travel options to people who are coming to our special places is building and maintaining another parking garage. And so it does behoove community vitality to not be a department of never ending parking. Um, it's a department of community vitality because we know that as long as people are continuing to drive, and we still have a high percentage of folks in our community and who are com coming to our community that use vehicles. We need to find a way to manage the storage of their vehicles while they're going about enjoying their days or working um, in a way that doesn't impact the overall vitality of our special places. And that's really what our program has been about for the past 50 years. And we're gonna continue to pursue that. And that's why we're trying to think more creatively about our parking operation in hopes that it will help encourage even more folks over time to transform their transportation behavior. Okay, um, thank you. I'm being asked to turn down my turn down my speaker. Okay, at this late hour. Okay, um, so how long prior to this uh, in, in the NPP slash ramp, Prior to this price increase, how many years was it? When when was the when, when have we ever had a price increase? Or when was the last price increase? Sam, I think you've got that one. 
Well, I don't want to say for certain. I maybe Chris, it's better if you take this one. It's been a number of years, but we've definitely had we've had a couple in the past. I think it started with twelve dollars um, in nineteen ninety. Were when I think, created. yeah, when Sam, when you were born, right? That's when uh, <laughs> I can tell I was born before the NPP program was created. <laughs> Sorry, I'm in an NPP neighborhood and mine went up, so it's been in the last two years. Okay, sure. It was $17 a year for quite some time, and now um, it's and now it's 30, in correct. 2005 is my, and Chris, I could be wrong about that. Was the last time we increased the price prior to this. The past year yeah okay i was thinking it was early 2000s was the and, and this last one was from 17 to 30. Okay. um so uh <clears throat> I, so i read the memo really carefully and uh again i talked to you both and my my input is that um, the price increases are are too small. That um, that when we go from after uh, somewhere close to fifteen years to go from seventeen to thirty dollars for a resident permit for a city asset is is inadequate, and to go from a hundred to one hundred and five for a commuter permit. And, and correct me if I get those wrong. Um, in a period of, of a long period of time is completely inadequate to uh, for us to use parking as a tool to reach our climate goals, our VMT reduction goals, uh, even our vision zero safety goals. It, 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 it seems completely inadequate to me. And I, and I based that um, partly at looking at CUs uh, and I didn't get exact figures. I, I talked to some people at CU, but you can't actually get pricing for a, a, a parking permit at CU unless you log in with your student registration and stuff. So it's not just published out there on the web. But my understanding is that as a CU full-time student, if I want to park my car, uh, it works out, they charge on the semester, but it works out to about $30 a month or $360 a year. Um, their garage rates start at $2 an hour and depending upon the event might be higher than that. Um, and so uh, when I look at our, our, our pricing and going from uh, $1.50 an hour to two dollars an hour in the in the very highest use, and then reducing our parking prices in in the lower use areas, it seems to me that we are actually encouraging uh, we are encouraging automobile use and just walking a little farther away than actually what I would have suggested would be to have the baseline of the current rate and increase. The higher usage zones from there, but without a commensurate decrease in in other zones. That 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 to me that decreasing parking costs right now in the current uh, uh, with our current set of goals doesn't doesn't make any sense. So um, again, I appreciate the work that went into this, but I'm I'm surprised and disappointed that. We, we didn't take this opportunity after all this work to actually make a big move and uh, to both generate revenue to meet our goals and to provide disincentives uh, for people to um, uh, drive their individual car and incentives for them to seek alternate ways to, um, uh, to, to visit downtown the hill, et cetera. I have a couple of things on trail access management, but I'm going to stop here for now and let others weigh in. Well, thank you. Other questions or comments here? I I have a, a, a very uh, basic question also that sort of springs off Mark's uh, inquiry, and that is, to get an explicit understanding of why 
we are having such modest rates for parking far away from downtown and so on. Uh, I think Mark made the point that, that we aren't really accomplishing several of our goals with this, including environment and diminishing vehicle miles traveled and so on. What is the logic for, for the rates that have been chosen there? So the strategy as far as performance-based pricing goes for our commercial areas was established through our process last year. Um, and so the work that Sam is doing now is really largely implementing established policy. And so in our conversations with council, while we did get a lot of feedback across the board of folks who would like for parking to cost a lot more, there are folks that have not communicated that. Um, for instance, we had suggested that we should start uh, charging for parking on Sundays um, and weekends in the in the downtown garages. Um, and council did not support that strategy when we were uh, presenting these uh, policies, uh, proposed policies to them last year. And so Sam has been charged with implementing uh, the strategy that was, was codified in ordinance last year. Um, related to uh, the rates, the, 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 the rate of change that, uh, that uh, we're seeing on street. So that's the 50 cents per year up to $5 per hour. So um, our rates could get up to $5 per hour over a series of years. It would be more gradual rather than very drastic is so that uh, folks who might not be so excited about these changes, um, uh, it might be able to, to uh, adjust uh, more appropriately. When it comes to the residential areas, I think it's really important to point out that it's the residents themselves that have elected to petition into the creation of a neighborhood parking permit program. And so it's really, uh, we need to be really careful about the rate that we are then charging them to participate in the program that they are asking the city to help them in managing the high amount of visitor parking that they're ex experiencing or spillover parking from commercial districts. Because the moment that we get to uh, too high of a rate for an annual permit just for the right to park your vehicle in front of your home that might have been built before uh, times that people had garages and driveways, um, you're going, we're going to find folks that don't want parking management at all. And so then we're gonna um, and start funding ourselves needing to back out of these programs. And then we're gonna have, we're gonna be back to square one in spillover into parking without a, a good permitting process to um, manage the parking. And so we're really trying to be very careful in these adjustments so that we don't uh, find ourselves um, with a lot of unintended consequences or negative externalities associated with uh, these adjustments. So. We have, again, a long, uh, rich history of being a model for managing parking in our commercial districts and our residential areas. Um, and we want to continue that history, but we're gonna want to be very thoughtful and careful about the adjustments that we make over time. And we will continue to make those adjustments as, as we have been. So have you started getting this feedback from neighborhoods already under the existing rates? Sam, do you want to speak to that? So, yes. Yes, the um, many residents have been very vocal about their thoughts on the NPP program, both related to the rates and pretty much everything else. Um, and we find that there's a lot of residents who feel very strongly that they shouldn't have to pay to park in front of their home at all and believe that you know the permit should be free to them. And I hear those comments quite often. So it can't, people have opinions on every, every, um, every side of the matter. And we've heard pretty much all of them um, and appreciate, appreciate you know, that variety and do our best to, to balance um, all the feedback that we hear and try Sorry. to create thoughtful programs. Do you, do you have some sort of a graphical presentation of rates versus complaints from the locals? No, that would be an interesting project though. Um, 
that, yeah, I, I can't say that I have any graphics or that we've tracked, uh, tracked that sp specific uh, um, metric, but it, it would be an interesting study. Yeah, I would say that, I mean, we have a front desk that issues permits to residents. So we often have, a, it's, it is not a, an email, you know, form that folks are complaining via some sort of formal complaint system. It's, we have customers that come in on a daily basis and they need to purchase these permits and uh, they're not uh, terribly pleased. Um, and they share that feedback with our front desk staff um, on a regular basis. Yeah, I can imagine uh, some imaginative invective uh, occasionally. Thank you. But never Sarah, it would never Sarah. No, I can't <laughs> complain. But I, I do have a, a question, um, which is more sort of a, maybe it's too soon to ask the question, but um, I know that um, there's discussion of expanding the um, ADU saturation limit and one of the elements that's being talked about is eliminating the uh, parking requirement for the market rate ADUs that might be built. Have you all begun to think about what implications that might have for um, street parking utilization? And um, I'm, so I'm just sort of curious if you started to start thinking about that. Thank you so much for the question. Um, I would say, you know, from Community Vitality's perspective, we really um, have the, I, I don't wanna say it's the um, unfortunate, but we, we, we have the job of administering the, the parking uh, uh, challenges and programs after a lot of these decisions have been made. So we're on the receiving end of um, land use and parking code decisions that you all are very much involved in. So um, I would say that that as um, when when our planning, our friends in planning are ready to start tackling some of these uh, parking code questions, we will certainly very much want to be at the table to communicate the implications. Um, because, you know, when it comes to the MPP or our residential access management um, work to date, it's been very much um, uh, related to folks who are parking in areas um, that they, uh, they're parking there because they want to avoid having to pay for parking or they're visiting uh, some major trip generator. When we're talking about folks or densifying um, uh, residential areas, if the folks who are parking up the street are the folks who also live there, um, our current management strategies are not designed to mitigate that. Um, because we're not, it's not like we're turning around and saying, hey, here's a bus pass instead, please get rid of your car altogether. We still, despite all the things that we do in this community, we do not have a very um, high percentage of folks who choose to live in Boulder without a car. And so we're very challenged in, in suggesting that, uh, yeah, adding more residential uses um, without additional parking um, on private property is going to lead to more conflict in um, and job security for everybody in community vitality. <laughs> okay. I appreciate that answer. And um, hopefully you all will be at the table when those conversations are happening. So there can be a real balance of um, objectives. Absolutely, thank you. Other questions or comments? Everyone's being pretty quiet. I don't know if it's because it's getting late or what, but, uh, oh, Mark. You're muted, Mark. I've been looking at my list of questions and comments and I'm, I've condensed them down a little bit. So I'm gonna conclude with um, a thought that relates the NPP slash ramp to the trail access program and to some other things. And that is the first thing is after having been involved in some open OSMP processes, the West Trail study area that involved neighbors and neighborhoods and people thought about parking in their neighborhood and trail visitors in their neighborhood. Um, one of the things that I 
discovered was that we can be fond, we Boulderites uh, can be fond of privatizing public spaces. We attempt to privatize the right of way in front of our house. We attempt to privatize access to trails, uh, what we see at our backyard with the privilege of living next door to open space or down the street from Chautauqua or a block away from our favorite restaurant downtown. And um, so I, I think that, uh, you know, your, your messaging about this, I hope is, is um, more finesse than mine, but I, I advocate for disabusing people of the idea that the public right of way, because it is in proximity to them, is somehow theirs. So um, and I'm sure that's a struggle for you. But anyway, I see it a lot in open space issues, parking issues, transportation issues. And in fact, um, I'm going to ask you, um, is there any truth to um, Knollwood residents uh, putting up illegal no parking signs or no trail access signs in their neighborhood. There is truth to the signs being posted, but there's also truth into the signs being removed very um, rapidly. Right. So, right. Yes. Right. And historically, when they were not annexed in the city, I think that there were signs that were up there that were that that uh, lasted a lot longer. And now that they are annexed into the city. Um, yeah, we are we are very quick to make sure that those get removed. Great, I really appreciate that. That's great. Um, one thing I sticking to trail access. Uh, yes, a lot of trailheads um, are predominantly auto access. I would uh, wager to say, having visited many many trailheads, that many are deficient in bike parking. Uh, and, and that we could all, OSMP, um, which has you know, more money than God, can, can help out everybody by um, uh, doing a better job about uh, bike racks and making bike access a desired way of uh, getting, getting there. Um, the uh, final thing is, how do we enforce against abuse? with the, a neighborhood parking permit or a ramp program. What I understand is, and again, this is anecdotal, I don't have any data, but um, that when you charge $30 for an annual fee uh, and you might claim, gee, I have uh, uh, four drivers in my house, my, uh, you know, my 18 year old kid and my 16 year old kid and my husband and I, and, that there is a traffic in parking permits. What do you know about that and how do we enforce against that? Sam, do you wanna take that one? I can do my best to answer this one and then Chris, you can take over if I have failed egregiously. Um, there are certain documents that our front desk staff require before issuing a permit. So we do require a vehicle registration to the registered owner and those types of information, or we require um, a, a lease or a sublease with the registered owner's name. So there's a number of different uh, documents that they'll need to review before they'll issue a permit. So you can't be getting a permit for a vehicle that is is not, you know, uh, registered to you or approved for use by you, if that makes sense. And one thing, thanks, Sam. One thing I would add to the, the extensive amount of documentation that we require is we are moving to license plate um, connected permits. So previously we had hang, hang tags and guest permits and visitor permits. And so yes, it would it would be easier for folks to um, be passing those around and uh, you know using the the existing rules. Um, to abuse the program, but as we are moving to license plate based permits, it will be much more challenging. They can't, they have to be trading license plates. So um, uh, that's our hope. So the last thing is what sort of coordination do we do with CU? Because my 
very cursory read of the situation is the CU is much more aggressive in their parking pricing. Hence, areas like baseline and 35th and stuff, because CU is actually, I think, more appropriately pricing their parking at the value of what a, uh, a surface lot spot should cost someone. And because Boulder is less aggressive, the city is less aggressive, we drive, uh, we incentivize students to go into neighborhoods. So what coordination have we done with CU uh, in regard to uh, parking pricing? Thanks for the question, Mark. Um, Tom McGann and I are best buddies and we meet quite regularly. Um, I totally understand and appreciate it. We talk, we talk about these issues quite regularly and the challenge is um, there's a lot of different dynamics in, in the decisions that the university makes and how they manage their very limited parking resources and what their priorities are when it comes to um, the amount of parking that they wanna provide for students, faculty and staff that all get universal bus passes. Um, they're in the center of, of lots of different transit um, options versus um, the, the city that does have some competing interests when it comes to, first of all, how, how expensive it is to manage um, uh, a parking uh, uh, program, especially the further away we get from there, our, our key activity centers, and then the importance of, of being a good partner with the business community who largely is paying for a lot of the services um, uh, as far as it comes to when it comes to the access services that we're providing to downtown employees. And so it's it's the, the our goals are a bit um, in competition with each other and it translates into some of these disconnects as far as how people experience the parking management, but we do work very closely with them. And um, I often do point to them if we're, when we are arguing and we're arguing for going from 12 or $17 a year uh, for a residential parking permit uh, to $30 a year, I was always quick to let everybody know that CU charges um, uh, their residents to park in at CU family housing $30 a month. So it's Correct. certainly, it's, I, we do follow their pricing very closely. We follow their technology very closely and we do work um, in, this conjunction, in conjunction as much as possible. Great. Well, thank you very much. Uh, again, a lot of work went into this and I appreciate it. And uh, uh, don't be afraid of raising the prices soon. Thanks. I, I have a one additional question, and that is to inquire whether you've noticed any impact of uh, unbundling parking from office buildings that uh, is becoming increasingly common. Uh, and, uh, you know, that it's it's something that sounds very appealing, and I'm unclear what the consequences of that are. Thanks for the question. Um, I, you know, it's certainly something, it depends on where we're talking about. We've unbundled um, office parking in the downtown for, again, the past 50 years, where by creating the, the Caged District, we essentially said that, that uh, commercial properties no longer had to um, build their own parking. Um, all the commercial properties were paying property taxes and the city assumed all that liability. Um, in Boulder Junction, it's been a bit different um, in the way that that area is developed. And then in, in uh, uh, future possible districts, it will be, it, it's, it'll be it continuing to be more creative and challenging. I'd say that um, the, there's a proposal in the station area plan over at 55th and Arapaho that suggests that we should have a, a parking district over there. Um, and so it's, I don't know how that's going to play out at this time. And I know we have a lot of work to do to get there. Um, so when it comes to the downtown, I'd say that on that end of the spectrum, it's been um, a huge part of our success. When we're exploring these unbundlings in, in newer developing areas, it is increasingly more complex 
Um, and uh, the results are probably more mixed. I don't know if that answers your question very well, but it's, it's <laughs> I'd say that it's across the board. Um, I don't know if anybody else in, in our, our friends at planning have any other additional perspectives, but um, that's, you know, that's been our experience thus far. Well, it sounds to me like an area that's ripe for some analysis, given the lack of uh, coherent uh, information on that. We, we do love uh, more and more data. Yeah. Thank you. Any other comments or questions from the board? Seeing none, I'll, I'll say thank I'll just, you. Real oh, quick, Lisa. John, just I worked briefly in community vitality and it's super exciting to see where this has come to. And um, yeah, I, I tend to fall more on the, I guess, theoretically, I fall more on the high cost of free parking, you know, right, put the prices up, but I also appreciate how, um, emotionally attached people are to their idea of uh, pieces of curb. <laughs> so thank you for your work on trying to um, balance this. And it's it's just exciting. I know a lot of us got put on hold for COVID and it's exciting to see it move forward. So great work. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you. You're off. Hopefully you are all um, wrapping up here very soon too. Oh, we Thanks. hope so too. <laughs> Good night. Good night. Okay. Well, that's the end of our formal program. We can do a matters from the staff and matters from the board and matters from our attorney here. Brad, any any matters? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I will mention real quickly that it's hard to believe, but we are uh, functionally pushing towards the end of the year at this point from a staffing and uh, work effort standpoint. It's essentially the end of the year for us. We have uh, a lot of uh, applications coming in on the planning side of things, uh, complicated ones. So uh, working to get those scheduled in and uh, and on a on a acceptable time frame for processing. On the building permit side of things, we are uh, still struggling with some of our service goals, uh, but making some headway. And my hope is that within a month or so, we'll, we'll be trending regularly in a positive direct direction in that regard. Uh, we have a lot of topics uh, that have been set up as council priorities or work program priorities. Uh, like the use tables. Uh, some of those have come up in discussion today, occupancy, ADUs. Uh, of course, we've also got, um, in addition to the use tables, the site plan criteria, several long range uh, or comprehensive planning projects as well. So we are working to figure out how to manage all of that, uh, given the staff vacancies that we had earlier in the year. Uh, in planning uh, both comprehensive and uh, development review. Uh, we are making good strides to filling most of those at this point, not all of them, um, but that is affecting our ability to uh, follow through on some of these projects. Uh, we will be discussing prioritization with council on uh, November 10th, but, um, but I do wanna make sure that the planning board members uh, that you all also are aware that we are working kind of under a certain level of just uh, duress and trying to uh, make sure that we fulfill some of the commitments that we've made on work program items and moving those forwards with uh, the realities of that staffing. Uh, the last thing I want to mention is uh, just a reminder of uh, what I've offered to you all individually and as a group in the past that I'm always available uh, by phone for uh, phone conversations. So feel free to ping me at any time. Um, I'm particularly open. Uh, afternoons on uh, tomorrow, Thursday, and uh, midday on Friday, but always happy to also set up a time. Uh, in fact, sometimes that's best uh, if you want to talk for 10 minutes, 15 minutes, whatever. Uh, just just know I'm happy to be a resource to each and every one of you. And that's all I've got, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you. And good luck with, the, with the hiring all the folks you're looking for. So. Thank you.
Okay, matters from the attorney, Elliot? No, nothing from my office. Okay. Everybody has a good night. Okay, thank you. And matters from the board. Debriefing, we had a fairly high-tempered meeting tonight. Laura. I'll try to make this quick because I know that people want to go to bed and so do I. I have two quick things. One is unrelated to, to tonight and one is related to tonight. So the unrelated one is Landmarks Board. Uh, and this may be familiar to those of you who have been on Landmarks Board uh, in the past, but something that came up in their meetings that really um, caught my attention was that there are several members of the Landmarks Board, including the chair, who have indicated an interest in potentially um, expanding the scope of criteria for denying a demolition permit. And currently they can deny a demolition permit based on historic value, like if it meets the criteria in the code that relates to landmarking for, for historic value. Um, but there are several board members that would like to be able to expand that beyond historic value to things like architectural interest, um, the environmental embodied energy value of the house, that kind of thing. Um, and apparently this was the focus of their um, letter to council last year, and they felt that that letter was not very effectively written. I haven't seen it. Um, I did ask for a copy, but they couldn't find one. <laughs> um, but it seems like it's a topic that they would like to uh, keep pushing forward on. So I just thought I would flag that for, for the planning staff, for this board. Um, I'm sure planning staff have heard that in the landmarks meetings as well. Um, but that might be something to keep an eye on. And I'm, you know, not not saying it isn't, I'm sure it would be interesting to some members of this board, but um, oh, yeah. uh, it's a conversation to be had. So that was the unrelated item. And then the related item, I really do have nothing personal against any member of this board. And I want to better understand what happened tonight because it sounds like I have seriously misunderstood the way this board has operated in the past. And I'm not saying that I agree to be bound by that in the future, but I want to at least understand it because it feels like at least four folks who are sitting here tonight who I greatly respect and esteem as my colleagues, and I do mean that sincerely, felt strongly enough about that historical precedent that the vote went the way it did. So I want to understand what I think I heard Lisa say, which is the way things have operated in the past is you take the main motion, anybody can offer a friendly, and that will be accepted, and then the board votes as a package on all of those things together, and if that fails, then you would entertain them separately. Am I understanding that that's the precedent or what, what is correct. the precedent? And Georgie might have a better take. Um, I'll, I'll just respond briefly and then Georgie, I think you're about to weigh in. Um, pretty correct, except that that there is no obligation to accept the friendly. Um, um, you know, the fact that that was turned out was totally fine. Um, and, and, it, and it may be, um, to Mark's point, honestly, like I don't have a copy of Robert's rule, so we may be doing it, you know, totally wrong according to that. I'm, I'm open to us reforming it entirely. Um, but but yeah, that we would bring the motion, someone could offer or not offer a friendly, friendly could be accepted or not accepted, then you would take the vote and then start kind of, you know, making it to what you want. But Georgie, you, I think maybe you're going to weigh in. And again, I, I, I don't really care how it goes. I just think we should figure out how we want to do it. I just want to understand what I did that was viewed as such a severe procedural violation, because it did seem like it evoked like some very personal reactions that I had done something egregious to harm the board and the board's harmony and the board's process. And I really want to understand that. So, so maybe let me take a stab at it, Laura. I, I, I didn't, I didn't certainly didn't take it personally. Um, let me give you an example that I think was, was, was far more contentious and far more detailed that we covered as a board, which was CU South. So CU South as an example, um, we went through things line by line um, for hours as a board. Um, we did not get to vote on things as a board line by line, each material item on CU South. We voted as a compromise and you voted up or down and then you explained your reasons for why you voted and why you would have voted differently if um, something had been included or not included. If we went through the process that you recommended today, and by the way, I, let me be clear, I'm not opposed to necessarily what you're saying. It's just not the way we function and not the way we've discussed things in the past. And so my point was, let's not change things on the fly. If we wanna have a discussion around those types of things, then let's have the discussion as a board. But 
I, I, I go I go back to CU South as a really easy example for I think everyone to understand here that there are lots of us that held our noses in one direction or the other and didn't agree with every single line item and still had to vote on that um, because of that. And so that that's that was the point. The point was the point was not what we were voting on. The point was that was the that's the process that we followed, um, and that was that that was that was what I was trying to illustrate. Not necessarily that we shouldn't consider changing our processes, but that that's anyways. Hopefully, that at least helps you understand my perspective. I'm honestly not sure that I really fully do, but I do appreciate the explanation. Like I get what you're saying that on a really complex issue like CU South, you cannot have a, a line item vote on everything. I get that. But what, what oh, we well, had you, in front you of us could. was- I mean, uh, you could, right? You could have a line item vote. We, we went through, we actually, if, if, you, if you go back and, and watch the film, we went line item by line item by line item and actually, and actually gave thumbs up or thumbs down on each of those line items as a board. Mm -hmm. And then when the vote came, we didn't break each one of those out. We voted on it in its entirety, or we made motions and friendly motions, et cetera, that ultimately we came to a compromise. I don't even remember what the vote was, but that was how, that's how we functioned. It was exactly like that, what we did tonight. Mark. And by the way, if we functioned like that on CU South, it would have been, you know, who, who knows what the direction of from planning board would have been on line item by line item. It would have been crazy. Oh, uh, that was a fairly painful situation mark so long before our little adventure in procedure that we had tonight um i was thinking okay gee uh i wanted to take advantage of the opportunity that we discussed which was hey under matters from the board let's 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 set our agenda and let's discuss some things and i had one thing that I wanted to discuss, and now I'd like to add another to it. Um, and the, the second item is this, the procedure for uh, making motions and voting. And, and just, I think that is a topic not for 1030, but that's a topic that could be a main a, a agenda topic at a future meeting. And I, I trust our chair and vice chair to work uh, with staff to find an appropriate meeting date soon, because we don't want to have another kerfuffle like this, um, <clears throat> to actually uh, visit. And, and I'm sure uh, I appreciate Brad's expertise in this, and I'm sure Hella will have some. And so anyway, I would propose that as a future meeting topic. Um, and, and I think that may feel make Laura feel unresolved in terms no, no, of I'm good. this tonight, but I would propose it as a serious meeting topic in the future. I, I don't think that, the, you know, 1040 at night is not the right time to have this discussion, but I did want to do something that Maro suggested, which is to use this matters time at the end to try to um, soothe is the wrong word, but like heal any damage that might have been done to our harmony as a board. I think that we are going to sometimes disagree on the factual matters and the, the substance before us. And it's not good if we are also disagreeing on process while we're using it. And so I apologize to the board if the process that I suggested, which it seems like it did, felt injurious to the members of the board who have been here for a long time. And or, uh, I do want us to work this out. No, no, no apology needed. Just be clear about that. Okay, thank you, John. So Mark, you were still- so The second, so the, the great. So if, if it's resolved that we're going to discuss process at a future meeting, uh, I hearken back to um, a, a prior meeting uh, where um, uh, some of us advanced uh, a particular project to go to DAB and I was confused about when a project can go to DAB, when it can't go to DAB, what's the right time, what's the, there must be a window. And I, I, I finished that meeting and um, I, I never felt resolved about that, nor do I really understand it. And there will be times in the future. So I would like that also to be a future meeting topic. It may not take very long, but I really wanna understand, and, and you guys can all say, hey, Marco, study it up. We don't wanna talk about it, but. 
I, I want to, I would like to understand uh, better when it is appropriate or not appropriate to recommend a project uh, be moved to the design advisory board. Okay, I think those are, I mean, those are two topics that are absolutely appropriate for us to pursue and discuss in a coherent way. And uh, I think on the DAB uh, referrals, staff and uh, and uh, the the city attorney's office will have some very clear guidance for us also. Lisa. Oh, um, sorry, I forgot my hand was up. But yeah, um, basically the same. You know, I, I think these would be great things to um, discuss, hopefully on a lighter um, night. And and yeah, I, I didn't feel like it was personal at all. I actually thought everybody was kind of doing their best and trying to get to a good ending. And, and as we sometimes do, we somehow ended up crossways and I'd like us to better understand what happened and come to agreement and how we want to handle it in the future. And yeah, I think all of that's good stuff. So, um, and I like how we're using this time now and, and not trying to totally figure it out because <laughs> um, we probably won't right now, but, um, but I think it's good for us to try to understand. And I, I'll think about it too. I'm, I'm not, I also am not entirely sure exactly what happened or how it happened. Um, and I probably won't know till it's light outside. Um, so, yeah. But no, I, I think I think we got to somewhere in the end, and hopefully it wasn't a bad spot. And I I didn't feel like it was anything personal. I, I felt like we all got a little like, ah, I'm so frustrated. But yeah. I didn't think anyone was trying to do a bad thing. So no no apologies needed from anybody. Okay. Well, I think uh, Sarah and I will will try and put this in the agenda pretty soon at a time when we're all coherent and able to think clearly and productively. COVID safe group hug. <laughs> this is the kind of thing where it would be really nice if we were all sitting in the same room and having dinner together before the meeting. But that'll come soon, I hope. Okay, any other matters? Let's go to sleep. I second that motion. Adjourn. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you.